Brand disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed by individuals on this platform, the callers plus invited guests are their own. The information you hear does not reflect the overall views of all parties associated with this brand. We encourage everyone to research all things heard live or via archive for edification purposes. Discretion is advised. Don't touch that dial. You're now listening to the Big Talk Free Radio. Help keep the show on the air. If you want to help, you can send your donation to PayPal. The email is you at gmail.com or through cash app, dollar sign, Sal Showtime. Thanks for your support. All right, and thanks again, Sal, and thanks again for everybody coming to listen to this particular segment. Uh, the reason why I decided to do this class is for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, um, if you've been following um, the Bay Talk for you lately, you'll know, already know that LeVar and Antoine have been um, taking it upon themselves to educate who LeVar likes to refer to, the babes in Christ, on the Septuagint and the Apocrypha. And like most things that we teach is met with misunderstanding and opposition. And that's okay. That's, expect, uh, that's expected. That comes with the territory. But I decided to do this particular class on Hanukkah because right now it is the feast of Hanukkah, Hanukkah going on right now. This is actually the third night of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a eight-day celebration. Now, there are all kinds of misconceptions about Hanukkah floating around on, on the Internet, and even a lot of these, surprisingly, Hebrew-Israelite camps. A lot of people think that Hanukkah was a pagan instituted feast. Some people have even put forth the idea that it's associated with Christmas, and none of that stuff is true. And then you got people who say, well, you know, it's not in the Bible, so we don't have anything, we don't have to have anything to do with it. Well, Hanukkah is mentioned in the Bible, sisters and brothers, and is not only mentioned in the apocryphal part of the Bible, but it's mentioned in other parts of the Bible as well. A lot of people don't know that the concept of Hanukkah has been going on since the time of Moses. Many people don't understand this. People say, well, Hanukkah, that's just in the apocryphal, and uh, they don't have any spiritual significance with us today. A lot of people don't even know that Jesus Christ, the Messiah himself, observed Hanukkah. And it's in the Bible, the regular King James Bible. And I want people to understand that Hanukkah is the season of dedication. And there is a lot of spiritual symbolism behind the observation of Hanukkah. We have to get understanding on this. We got to stop listening to what people tell us about things and get into the habit of doing our own personal research. Um, one of the things that Sal emailed to us about the ba- what the Babes in Christ was saying is that when they took the Apocrypha to their pastors or their elders, their elders or pastors immediately dismissed it saying, uh, you don't have to um, um, l- listen to that or that stuff is garbage. And a lot of people don't know that the Septuagint actually gave birth to the Apocrypha. So you got people who read the Apocrypha but don't want anything to do with the Septuagint, and if it wasn't for the Septuagint, there would be no Apocrypha. The Apocrypha, the Apocrypha first appeared in the Septuagint. So a lot of people don't know that when you attack the Septuagint, you're actually taking a shot at the Apocrypha. And all of this is due to lack of research. And we're gonna, we have a lot of research in this class for you, as well as plenty of scripture. So at the end of the night, by the time this class is over, there will be no doubt in your mind that Hanukkah was a celebrated holy day among the Hebrew Israelites at some point in history. It was not a mandatory holy day, neither is it a mandatory holy day now. But it was a holy day of deep, historical and spiritual significance to such a degree that even Jesus Christ himself partook in it. And the concept of it did not start 
during the time of Judas Maccabees, who we're going to read about later, but in the time of Moses. So without further ado, we're going to get this started at Exodus 25, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to skip. Antoine, I'd like to start off with you reading. Exodus 25 and verses 1 and 2. Because this is very important. Let me know when you get there. This is Exodus 25 and verses 1 and 2. You there, Antoine? Yes, I'm there. I'm sorry. I have my mic muted. Um, okay. Exodus chapter. Go on, Exodus 25 and verses 1 and 2. And then we're going to skip. Go ahead and read, please. Exodus 25 and 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they may, that they bring me an offering. Of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall take mine offering. Mm-hmm. We we'll skipped where? Okay, oh, uh, this oh, say, I'm sorry, verse one was so short. I thought you had to read verse two. Okay, so it says, "Speak unto the children of Israel that they may bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Shall ye take my offering?" These offerings was were for the tabernacle to construct the tabernacle. Everybody had to contribute to the construction of the tabernacle, right? If you keep reading, you can read about all the stuff that they needed, but we're not going to get into that. What we're getting into is what this was actually for. Skip down and read verses 8 and 9. Go ahead. Exodus 25 and 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, this was the purpose of the sanctuary, that he may dwell among them. The sanctuary and tabernacle are used synonymously. They're referring to the same thing. And later, the tabernacle, which was a mobile giant tent, later became the temple. Before they had the temple, they had this giant tent that they would set up and then they would take down and they would move and they set up and they take down. This happened the whole time they were in the wilderness. But once they got into the land of Canaan, which was the promised land, they eventually built a stationary place of worship that they later named Jerusalem. And that's where they had their temple at. But read verse 9. Exodus 25 and 9. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye, uh, ye make it. So he said, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the instrument thereof, that means the instrument in it, even so shall ye make it. So this tabernacle was for the purpose of God dwelling among his people Israel. That was the purpose of the tabernacle. And he asked for offerings to construct this tabernacle. And now he's telling them what he wants what he want in the tabernacle. Right? right? But now, LeVar, let's go over to chapter 27. All right. And we're going to read verses 1 and 2. So we're going to take a look at a particular instrument that was in the tabernacle. Because a lot of people don't know that all of this, is directly related to Hanukkah. But people will tell you, oh, that's some old garbage. We don't want to have anything to do with that. All of this that you're reading right here, that we're reading in this, is directly related to Hanukkah. And people will tell you, even Hebrew Israelites, surprisingly, will tell you, oh, we don't want to have anything to do with that. That stuff, that's, that's pagan. They have no idea what they're talking about. A lot of people love to shoot things down simply because they haven't done the research on it. A lot of us, just by inclination, reject things. We have to grow out of that. Before we disagree, let's do some research. And we got a lot of research for you here tonight, right? But this is Exodus 27 and verses 1 and 2. Go ahead and read, please. Exodus 27 and 1. And thou shalt make an altar of shit and wood, Hold up, it says you shall make a what of shit some wood? Altar. An altar. It says you shall make an altar of shit some wood. Pay attention to that because this is important. You shall make an altar of shit some wood. Keep reading. Five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square and the height thereof shall be three cubits. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Verse 2, and thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it 
with brass. Now, we're talking about an altar that had horns and that was overlaid with brass. But what was the purpose of this altar? And what does it have to do with Hanukkah? You're going to see, sisters and brothers. Just be patient. We're going to show you all of this because a lot of people don't know that what happened during Hanukkah with Judas Maccabees had already happened several times before. In other words, Hanukkah is nothing new. The only thing Judas Maccabee did is made it an official national holiday or holy day. That's all he did. But what he did was something that had been occurring in Israel's history for centuries. And people don't know this. But let's see what this altar was for. Laval, skip down and read verse 84. Skip all the way down to verse 84. Because people need to know this stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me tell them in the right spot here. I'm sorry. Um, not Lavar, but Antoine. Give me number chapter 7. I'm, I'm getting a little mixed up here. We ain't getting there yet. We're going to go there a little late. I can look ahead of myself. Let's go to number chapter 7, Antoine. All right. And when you get there, read verses 1 and 2. And then after that, we're going to skip to 84. Numbers chapter 7. And I want you to read verses 1 and 2. We're looking at this altar. And what it was for. Num- Numbers 7, 1 and 2. Go ahead and read, please. Numbers 7 and 1. And it came to pass on the day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle and had anointed it and sanctified it and all the instruments thereof, both the altar and all the vessels thereof, and had anointed them and sanctified them. So Moses set up the tabernacle, and he anointed, which means smeared with oil, all the instruments thereof, including the altar. We're dealing with the altar here, right? Because the altar is the most important instrument in understanding the significance of Hanukkah. That's the most important thing, right? It says he anointed them and sanctified them. Keep reading. That the princes of Israel, heads of the houses, heads of the house of their fathers, who were the princes of the tribes, and were over them that were numbered, offered. Now all these princes offered, right? That's what it's telling you. They offered what? Sacrifices. Now let's see what they offered particularly. Skip down and now read verse eighty four. Number seven and eighty four. Because you can read all this on your own time because it's running down a whole bunch of sacrifices. I'm just getting to when it talks about the altar again. Verse 84. Go ahead, Antoine. Number 7 and 84. This was a dedication of the altar. Hold on. Stop, 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 stop. It said this was the what of the altar? Dedication. Keep that word in mind because the title of this class is Hanukkah, the season of dedication. And it just said this was the Dedication of the altar. Keep reading. And the day when it was anointed by the princes of Israel, 12 charges of silver, 12 silver bowls, 12 spoons of gold. Okay, now skip down to verse 88 and watch what it says again, because you can read about all these other instruments and sacrifices on your own time. But go and read verse 88. Go ahead. Number 7 and 88. And all the oxen for the sacrifice of the peace offering were twenty and four bullocks, the ram sixty, the he goat sixty, the lambs of the first year sixty. This was the dedication of the altar. After that, it was anointed. It after, said it after, again. This, yeah, after that, it was anointed. It said this was the dedication of the altar. Now, why is it that it keeps using the word dedication? And keep in mind, this is the first place of worship that remotely resembled a temple that the Israelites ever had as a nation. It's the first place of worship, the tabernacle, which was a giant tent. But they had to have a dedication for the altar when they first built this tabernacle. So what is this dedication? What we're going to do is we're going to go to the strong concordance, and I'm going to read it. And we're going to look up the word translated dedication in both of these verses, in verses 84 and 85, and it's 2598 in the Hebrew section. Again, there's 2598 in the Hebrew section, and this is the word, shanukah, and it means initiation, that is, 
consecration, meaning something holy, dedicating or dedication. So the word is Shanuka, which comes into to our English language as Hanukkah. So when you read your Bible and you look these words up in the Hebrew, when it says this was the dedication of the altar, what this is saying is this was the dead on the Hanukkah of the altar. This is the Hebrew word for Hanukkah. Shanuka. And if you ask any Hebrew Israelite or any so called Jew or do your own research and ask if this is the Hebrew word for Hanukkah, they will tell you yes. So that's what it is. It comes into our English language as Hanukkah, but the Hebrew word is Shanuka. So they were already having Shanuka or Hanukkah in the days of Moses. The only thing it's talking about is the dedication of the altar, which ultimately means the dedication of the tabernacle. And later on, we're going to read it, when they did the same thing with the temple, which was ultimately the dedication of the temple because they had to dedicate the altar. That's all it is, sisters and brothers. So how can anybody have a problem with Hanukkah when Hanukkah technically has been going on since Israel first became a nation? Does anybody have a problem with it? Because they lack understanding. They don't do any research. But let me show you this again, and we're going to get to it. Um, let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 7. And, LeVar, let's go there. We're going to Second Chronicles chapter 7, and then we're going to read verses 1 to 3, and we're going to skip. This is when Solomon built the temple. See, we don't understand this stuff. We don't understand that just because we don't know something, it doesn't automatically make it wrong. We don't understand that. What we want to do, I ain't never heard of that. My camp don't do that. My church don't do that. So I'm going to disagree with it. I'm going to debate it. Instead of just saying, you know, I ain't never heard that before. Let me go behind this brother and do my own research and see if he's telling the truth. Let me do that. Nobody wants to do that. Everybody just wants to oppose. That's what a lot of people want to do. Because they feel by opposing you, they're somehow making themselves look great. Not about that, Susan Brooks. ABT is not about that. But this is Second Chronicles chapter 7, and we're going to read verses 1 to 3, LeBron. When you get there, go ahead. And it reads, Now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And you can read about Solomon's prayer in the previous chapter, chapter 6. Go ahead and read. Verse 2. And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped. And praise the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. So now a transition has occurred, sisters and brothers. They have moved from the tabernacle, which was a mobile place of worship, to a stationary place of worship in Jerusalem, known as the temple or the house of God in your Bible. Now they're doing this. So now since they're constructing a new place of worship, they have to do the same thing they did for the tabernacle. They have to do the same thing all over again. They have to start over and do everything over again as far as, like, dedication. You follow what I'm saying, right? And they rebuilt some instruments in Israel history too, which we're going to read about, right? But skip down and read verses 8 and 9 and watch what it tells you. Verse 8, also at the same time Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all Israel with him, a very great congregation, from entering in Hamath unto the river of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And in the eighth day they made a solemn assembly. In the eighth day they made a solemn assembly. This is going on during the time of tabernacles, right? But in the eighth day they made a solemn assembly, and what else happened? Go ahead. For they kept the dedication of the altar seven days, and the feast 
seven days. And they kept the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. Again, sisters and brothers, that word translated dedication is the Hebrew word chanukah. 2598 in the Hebrew section of your song, chanukah, which comes into our English language as Hanukkah. Just look it up. That's your Hanukkah right here. We have not left the King James Version Bible, and I've already given you Hanukkah twice. So why do people get out of it? Hanukkah, what is that? What, what, that that's pagan. I, I ain't never heard of Hanukkah. This is why we tell y'all to look up words. You got people, man, I don't get off into all that looking up words stuff. That's why you don't understand this stuff. What type of person doesn't want to open up a dictionary and know the definition of a word? This is the type of person who doesn't want truth. They want to remain in the darkness. And if they call themselves a teacher, they want you to remain in the darkness with them. But this is Hanukkah. This is Chanukah. Look it up if you don't believe me. So they kept Hanukkah seven days, but it was not an official holiday or holy day at this time. It had no significance at this time to for anybody to say, okay, let's make this into a yearly thing. But it would in the future. So this is not a new concept. So far y'all have saw that every time they started or constructed a place to worship for God, they had to have a dedication for the altar. The altar is the instrument they sacrificed the animals on. So they had to have a dedication for the altar. They had to have a chanuka for the altar, right? And then later on in 586 or 587 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Solomon's temple. He destroyed the altar. He destroyed everything. But after 70 years, Israel was allowed by the decree of Cyrus to go back to the land, go back to Jerusalem, and rebuild the temple. So, again, we are starting over. So, already I've shown you the pattern. Every time they had to start over, what did they have to do? They had to have a dedication for the altar. So, let's see if they did it again. Let's go to the book of Ezra, Antoine. Ezra chapter 6. You got too many people who just refuse to do the research. And they just want to debate. And they don't understand why something is just not, or just not debatable. They're just not. Well, let's look at it. I don't believe in looking up words. Well, let's see what they say. I don't, I don't believe in looking up stuff in Bible dictionaries. Then what do you believe in? Well, I don't believe in that. Well, we do. So we can never satisfy you. Because anything we present to you, you reject it. We believe it. If it's in the Bible, we believe it. But you need to be able to know the definition of some of these words. First of all, here's a little fun fact for y'all. Did y'all know that the King James Version Bible was not completely translated into English? There are many words in the King James Version Bible left untranslated. That is the truth. So how would you know what these untranslated words mean unless you look them up? People don't know stuff like this. If you knew that dedication meant Hanukkah, and it always was in relation to the um, initiation or the, or the construction of the altar, if you knew that, then by the time you get to the Apocrypha and it talks about Hanukkah or dedication there, it wouldn't be such a big deal. You're like, well, I mean, they've been doing that for centuries. That ain't nothing new. But because, number one, you struck out because you don't want to look up the definition of words in the Hebrew to see what they mean. So now when you hear a term like Hanukkah, oh, that's unfamiliar to me. Hanukkah, what is that? That ain't in my Bible. Or oh, actually, it is several times. If you take the time to look up certain words, you see it. It's right there. But people like to hide behind translations to keep you in the dark. All they see when they read the Bible is the word dedication. That's all they see. And ironically, when you go to the Apocrypha, it's translated dedication. But there's still no way around it. And we got 
several sources to back this up. It's in the Bible, Old and New Testament. I've already given it to you three times. Why would somebody be like, well, I can't get with that? And we're going to show you the spiritual significance behind it. I keep telling y'all, don't believe me. Look it up. Check it out. Research it for yourself. And then you go back and you tell, you come back and you tell me if I made it up or if you came across the same thing I came across. And if you came across the same thing that I came across, why are we debating? It's not really me who you're arguing with. It's my research that you don't like. I don't like that research. Here's a little another fun fact for y'all, sisters and brothers. The reason why a lot of people try to tell y'all to steer clear of the apocrypha and the Septuagint is because it reveals the falsehood and misunderstandings of their teaching. That's the real reason. That's why they want to get rid of it. That's why it got to go. They want it out of there. Because when you go to the Septuagint and you go to the apocrypha, a lot of stuff in the New Testament becomes more clear, and a lot of stuff in the Old Testament is explained. That's all the apocrypha is. It's just an explanation and, a, um, and, expound, uh, and it expounds on the Old Testament. That's all it does. And it fills the gap between the Old and the New Testament, which means it helps you understand what was going on during the time of the New Testament. I'm going to give you all an example of that. But all these pastors and leaders and teachers, they don't want you to mess with this stuff because then you're going to start saying, wait a minute, um, I was just listening to this class on debate talk for you, and he looked up the word dedication in the Hebrew, and they gave us Chanukah, which is Hanukkah. So, and that was all the way back as far as Exodus, the second book in the Bible. So if they were celebrating the Hanukkah or the Chanukah back then, why are people looking crazy because people are doing it now? And like I said, I'm going to show you that Jesus Christ observed it. Surely nothing can be wrong with it if our Lord and Savior observed it. But just in case, you didn't have to be a I don't believe that New Testament type person. Then I showed you in the Old Testament too. It's not a mandatory holy day, though, sisters and brothers. It's not. So don't call in and say, man, show me Hanukkah in Leviticus 23. Don't call in and do that because I'm not saying it's a mandatory holy day. I'm saying it has deep spiritual and historical significance for the Hebrew Israelites and the Christian. Here's another little fun fact for you. Anytime in the New Testament it records Jesus observing a holy day, read it, and you will see that on almost every occasion he reveals some deep mystery about himself or about the Father. And Hanukkah is no exception. People don't know that, right? But we're moving on. Um, Ezra chapter 6, who I said was reading for me? That's one. Me, yeah. Yeah, Ezra chapter 6. And we're going to read verses 13 to 18. Remember, every time they had to make a new temple, they had to start over. That's what they had to do. They had to have a Hanukkah for the altar. That's what they had to do. This is Ezra chapter 6, verses 13 to 18. Go ahead and read. Then Tatne, governor of this side of the river, Shethar Bozne, and their companions, according to which Darius the king had sent. So they did speedily. Mm-hmm. Verse 14. And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophecy of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah, son of Edu. And they built it. And finished it according to the commandment about of the, the God. temple of God. It's talking about the temple of God. They are rebuilding the temple of God that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 uh, B.C. or 587 B.C. They are rebuilding the temple. That's what they're doing here. They're starting over. Go ahead and read. According to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Mm-hmm. And this house was finished on the third day of the month Adar, which was the which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. Mm-hmm. And the children of Israel, the priests, and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with joy. Oh, they kept the what? Dedication. They kept the dedication again. Twenty five ninety eight in the Hebrew section of the song. 
That word is Chanukah, which is Hanukkah. It comes into our English language as Hanukkah. They, in other words, they're simply saying they celebrated Hanukkah. That's what it means to keep something. Y'all know that, keep my commandments, keep my feet. That means observe or celebrate. So they were celebrating Hanukkah, but it was not an official state holy day or national holy day at this time. But they had already celebrated it other times in history. So I'm trying to get people to see. But because you refuse to look up a single word, you'll never understand it. That's why these brothers get so upset at us. Why y'all always got to look up words? Because we want to know the definition. We want to know what they mean. See, now you can't hide anymore and try to kick against Hanukkah because now if you have a problem with Hanukkah, now you got to get rid of Ezra. Now you got to get rid of um, Second Chronicles. Now you got to get rid of Exodus. Now you got to get rid of Numbers. That's why I said they kept the dedication of the house of God. But remember, it's always related to the altar. Go ahead and read. Uh, verse 17. And offered at the dedication of this house of God an hundred bullocks, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and for a sin offering for all Israel, 12 he goats, according to the number of the 12 tribes of Israel. So they're sacrificing. And you know if they're sacrificing, they need an altar, right? You know that. So they had to rebuild the altar because that's what you're really doing. You're dedicating the altar, which ultimately sanctifies the whole house. That's why it's sometimes called the dedication of the house of God. But the house is dedicated through, uh, through sanctification of the altar. And they call that dedication Hanukkah. So anytime you read in your Bible where somebody is keeping the dedication of the house of the Lord, that is Hanukkah. So did anybody ever observe Hanukkah in the King James Version Bible before you even get to the Apocrypha? The answer is yes. How can you tell me, oh, I have a problem with that? I don't like that's pagan. This is pagan? This is pagan? Ezra is pagan? Exodus is pagan? Numbers is pagan? You have no understanding. Your understanding is pagan. You're wearing pagan sunglasses, meaning you are seeing only paganism where you want to see it. This has nothing to do with any Christmas. This has nothing to do with any so-called Jews creating a fake holiday. People say, happy Hanukkah, see the old Edomites, they gave us that. No, they didn't. Our Hebrew forefathers were observing Hanukkah every time they had to cleanse the temple. Every time they had to rebuild the temple, they kept a dedication for the altar. That Chanukah, Hanukkah, and they're doing it right here again. Every time they have to start over, they do that. Until finally, Judas Maccabees just said, you know what? We don't did this so many times in our history. Let's make it an official holiday. It's not mandatory. But it has spiritual and historical significance. That's why ABT celebrates it. And we are not pagans. I'm showing you this. Well, why y'all do this? People love to ask us why we do what we do. And we're showing you right here. Nobody can argue these scriptures. It's right here. But finish that off, please. Verse 18. Hello? Antoine, see that? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Ezra 6 and 18. And they set mm -hmm. the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. So they set the priests in their divisions because the priests are the ones that perform the sacrifices on the altar, y'all. We have to understand that. That's why I call this class Hanukkah the season of dedication. They were dedicating the temple. That's what they were doing. But now, let's move on. Now we're going to go to the Septuagint and go to the Apocrypha in the Septuagint. We're going to go to 1 Maccabees chapter 1. If you have a Septuagint, it's on page 
139 of the Apocrypha section. Because once you get to the Apocrypha section, it starts over. So it's page 139 of the Apocrypha section. We're going to 1 Maccabees chapter 1, and we're going to see the history behind the Hanukkah celebration. Because I've already showed y'all that this has happened other times in Israel's history. And I just gave you three places. There's other times you can read about it. Every time a king defiled, when you read in the Bible, in Kings or in Chronicles, it says such and such a did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he put pagan idols in God's temple. Every time a succeeding king came along and cleaned the temple out, they had to dedicate that stuff all over again. That was Hanukkah. People don't understand this stuff. It happened with Hezekiah. Go ahead and read Second Chronicles chapter 29. With King Hezekiah. So Hanukkah is not something that just popped up in the apocalypse. It's not something that just fell out of, fell out of the air. They said, let's just do this. It is not. But we're going to first Maccabees, LeBar, and we're going to start reading at verse 7. We're going to read 7 to 10, then we're going to skip. When you get there, go ahead. Okay. First Maccabees, chapter 1, verse 7, it reads, So Alexander reigned 12 years, and then died. This is talking about Alexander the Great. Y'all have heard of him. Yes, our Hebrew history speaks of Alexander the Great. He was over the Greek Empire. Go ahead and read. Verse 8. And his servants bear rule everyone in his place. Mm-hmm. And after his death, they all put crowns upon themselves. So did their sons after them many years. And evils were multiplied in the earth. It said evils were multiplied in the earth. This was the Hellenization period, the period in which the Greeks wanted everybody to live and talk like Greeks. This is the Hellenization period that you're getting into. Go ahead and read. Verse number 10, and there came out of them a wicked root, Antiochus, surnamed Epiphanes son of Antiochus the king, who had been in hostage at Rome, and he reigned in the 130th, 37th year of the kingdom of the Greeks. So now we got this guy named Antiochus, surname Epiphanes. And that word Epiphanes means God incarnate or God in the flesh. This guy was claiming to be God in the flesh. And that word comes into our language, epiphany, as like a revelation. Like, we just, I just had a revelation. I just have an epiphany. You follow what I'm saying? So now we got this guy right here named Antioch's Epiphany, right? He's a Greek. That's what he is, right? Let's see some of the horrible things that he did. Skip down, and we're going to read verses 20 to 23. We're in the book of Maccabees. This is in the Apocrypha. But we are reading from the Apocrypha in the Septuagint, because that's where the Apocrypha originally Appeared at. It was not in the King James Version or the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text. It was not in there. It appeared in the Septuagint first. And then, you know, later on, after they started dividing up books, they started putting books with any other books they wanted to, to be with. You follow what I'm saying? But the Septuagint gave birth to the Apocrypha. But this is 1 Maccabees 1, and we're going to read verses 20 and 23. Go ahead and read, Lamar. You want me to read 20 through 23 or 20 and 23? 20 to 23. Okay. Verse 20, and after that Antiochus had smitten Egypt, he returned again in the 140th, 40 and third year and went up against Israel and Jerusalem with a great multitude and entered proudly into the sanctuary and took away the golden altar and the candlestick of light, and all the vessels thereof. Verse 22, and the table of the showbread, and the pouring vessels, and the vials, and the censer of gold, and the veil, and the crown, and the golden ornaments that were before the temple, all which he pulled off. So this guy came in and he looted the temple. It said he took the golden altar, not to be confused with the altar of sacrifice, which was an altar of brass. But he took all this stuff out of the temple. That's what he did. He looted the temple. But what else did he do? Keep reading. He took also the silver and the gold 
and the precious vessels. Also, he took the hidden treasures which he found. So he just completely stripped the temple of all his treasures. And you can read about these treasures in um, Exodus 25 and in Second Chronicles chapter um, 7, 5, and 4, all the stuff that Solomon put in the temple. This man completely stripped the temple. But what did he do with the altar? First of all, he was already defiling the temple by being in there and not being a Levite. So the temple was already defiled when he set foot in it, right? But now, skip over to verse 41, and we're going to read 41 to 51, then we're going to skip. So let's see what else he did. Go ahead. Verse 41, moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people, and everyone should live his laws. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. So Antiochus wrote to his kingdom that everyone should lead his laws. So all the heathen, I mean all the nations agree, all the Gentiles agree according to his commandments, right? You got to leave your laws. He said we should be one people. In other words, a one world government where everybody has to do the same thing religious-wise. This is a foreshadow to the Antichrist. But go ahead and read. Verse 43, Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion and sacrificed unto idols and profaned the Sabbath. It says many Israelites consented to his religion and sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. They started breaking the Sabbath. They did not observe the Sabbath anymore. Because they consented to his religion and worshiped idols. He worshiped Jupiter. Or in the Greek, Zeus. He worshiped Zeus. He worshiped Mercury. Also known as Hermes. He worshiped all these Greek gods. Right? And the Israelites did the same thing too when they worshiped his idols. So this guy is trying to Hellenize the whole world. Israel is no exception. We want you to start worshiping your God too. Go ahead and read. Verse 44. For the king had sent letters by messengers unto Jerusalem and the cities of Judah that they should follow the the strange laws of the land and forbid burnt offerings and sacrifice and drink offerings in the temple. And they should profane the Sabbath and festival days. That they should profane the Sabbath and festival days, meaning the weekly Sabbath and the holy days like Passover, unleavened bread, tabernacles, day of atonement. Profane them. You are no longer allowed to observe them. That's what that man decreed. And it was not an option. You had to do it or face certain death. But what else did he do? Keep reading, LeVar. Uh, Verse 46. And pollute the sanctuary and holy people. Set up altars and groves and chapels of idols and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean beasts. It said, and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean beasts. I'm going to show you later on when we read this that he put the altar that he made on top of God's altar. So he defiled the altar that had been dedicated. So he's messing all of this up. No Sabbath worship is not allowed. No holy day worship is not allowed. And you have to eat pork. It's mandatory. You have to eat it. So me how Christians would think today that God all of a sudden made eating swine okay when people were dying rather than eat swine. Then God going to come along after all these people suffered and be like, okay, now y'all can eat it. What a spit in the face that would be to everybody back then. Right. Ain't nothing changed. Nothing to change. You still don't supposed to eat that stuff today. All of this related to Hanukkah. But notice we're getting into the, the altar and stuff. Remember, y'all already know, if you've been listening from the beginning, you already know that they got to start over. Y'all already know. But I'm going to let y'all read it anyway. See, I like to teach the Bible in a way that a pattern develops. So by the time I go to my next scripture, you already know what it's going to say, even if you never read it. That's how the Bible does. 
It has a pattern. So if the Bible sets a pattern and your teacher or your elder goes outside of that pattern, then chances are your teacher or your elder is a false teacher. So if you got anybody jumping up saying, why are you celebrating Hanukkah? That's pagan. That didn't have anything to do with God. Then you're breaking the pattern because the pattern shows that he constantly shut the Hanukkah of the altar. That's what they did. So now that we see that this temple is being defiled and pulled down and everything else, y'all already know that they're going to have to rededicate it again. But we're going to keep reading. Go ahead, LeVar. Verse 48, that they should also leave their children uncircumcised and make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanliness and and profane nation. And profanation. Profanation, excuse me, <clears throat> verse 49, to the end they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. It said leave their children uncircumcised. Circumcision, physical, literal circumcision was even illegal at that time. Why? Because it pertained to God's law. And he told everybody they had to abandon God's law. That's what they had to do. This guy is a prototype, or should I say was a prototype, for the Antichrist. This is the reason why when a lot of people read about him in the book of Daniel, they think they're reading about the Antichrist. But this guy comes about the Greek Empire. So if you're reading about a guy who's going to do all of this and the book of Daniel tells you he's coming out of the Greek Empire, then you know it cannot be the Antichrist. But he's so similar to the Antichrist that people often think when they read Daniel that they're talking about the Antichrist when they're really talking about him. That's where the confusion comes in at. But I can, uh, that's an honest mistake, only if you don't have the Apocrypha. And because a lot of these people don't have the Apocrypha, they don't know about anybody else in history that did these things. So they say, hey, it only got to be the future. No, somebody else in history did this already. That's right. We don't know this. But if you put the Apocrypha back and read it, then you will see. Wait a minute. This ain't talking about no Antichrist. This is about Antioch of Epiphany. Mm-hmm. He took away the daily sacrifice in the temple. That's mm-hmm. what else he did. Can you read the uh, LeBar? Verse 50. And whosoever would not do according to the commandment of the king, he said he should die. Whosoever did not do according to the commandment of the king, he said he should die. That means if you were caught observing the Sabbath, you were killed. If you were caught observing Passover, you were killed. If you were caught circumcising your son, you were killed. If you refused to eat swine's flesh, you were killed. This was a horrible time for the children of Israel. Horrible time to be a Hebrew Israelite. And for the rest of the nation, they were pagans anyway. He wasn't really mm-hmm. forcing them to do anything that they didn't do anyway. This is why when the Antichrist comes on the scene, only people who are really keeping God's laws and statutes and the true faith of Jesus Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach is going to be in trouble. The rest of the world is going to fold like origami. They're going to be ready. Hey, yeah, we do this anyway. You know, I, it's high time we made Sunday mandatory. Preachers are going to jump all over that. Mm. I'm, I'm glad we're making it mandatory. I'm glad we're forcing you to have a... Christmas ham. You have to eat it. They didn't have a choice. You had to eat it or die. Mm. This was a horrible time. Verse 51, please. In the self-same manner wrote he to his whole kingdom and appointed overseers over all the people, commanding the cities of Judah to sacrifice city by city. They had to sacrifice city by city, and he had overseers um, over all the people, meaning he set up sentinels, guards, to make sure his commandment was carried out. He just didn't work on the honor system. Okay, now y'all make sure y'all give up y'all laws, and y'all make sure y'all eat that swine, and I'm going to check in periodically to make sure y'all doing it. No, that ain't how it went down. He had guards set up over Israel in every city to make sure they were worshiping his pagan gods. A lot of folks don't know his name is Antioch of Epiphany, but the history will tell you that the Hebrews re-nicknamed him Antioch of Epiphany, which means madman or crazy man. 
because he was crazy, right? But now, LeBron, skip down to verse 54, and we're going to read verses 54 to 64. Let's see what else this guy did. Go ahead and read. Verse 54, now the 15th day of the month, Kazlu, in the 145th year, they set up the abomination of desolation upon the altar. Oh, they set up the what upon the altar? The abomination of desolation. See, this is why you need the Apocrypha. Because if you come from the church I came from, whenever you hear about abomination of desolation, you think Antichrist. You think Somebody coming in the future. First of all, the abomination of desolation, even as spoken of in the regular Bible, was never an individual. It is not an individual. Abomination of desolation, if you read Matthew 24 and cross-reference it with Luke chapter 21, which is talking about the same thing, Matthew calls it abomination of desolation. Luke calls it when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Know that the desolation thereof is not. The abomination of desolation, in other words, is when somebody defiles or destroys God's temple. It is not an individual. It is not a person. You can never read that being a person. I'm not saying that the Antichrist isn't a person, but the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation are two different things. Just like Antiochus Epiphany and the abomination of desolation are two different things. Antiochus Epiphany was an Antichrist type. The abomination of desolation is what he set up. It's what he did. It wasn't an individual. So he set up the abomination of desolation upon the altar, which lets you know something else, listen, brothers. There's more than one abomination of desolation mentioned in the Bible. That's what I'm getting mm-hmm. at. Mm-hmm. It, happened, it happened once in Israel's history, and it happened again in Israel's history. It happened again in 70 A.D. That's the abomination of desolation when the temple was destroyed by the Romans. It was an abomination because Romans were in the holy place. And it was a desolation because they destroyed it. Just like Antioch's Epiphany, Greeks were in the holy place, and it was a desolation because they destroyed it. It was an abomination because it was foreigners in there, and they were also profaning it with unclean things. And you can read that in Josephus about how they were defiling the temple. And they tried to defile the temple several times before 70 AD, and the Hebrews fought against them and didn't let them do it. So you don't know your history. When you know your history, you won't, you won't get confused. But he said he set the abomination of desolation upon what, Lamar? Upon the altar. Upon the altar. So it's safe to say that the altar is defiled, right? That's right. It's defiled. So we know the pattern. If the altar is defiled, we're going to have to rededicate it. We've got to dedicate it again. And we know that's Chanukah. That's Hanukkah. But continue reading. You all read verse 51? All the way through? Uh, verse 51. I'm all right. 54. No, yeah, 54. Keep going. Keep going. My bad. Keep going. They set up the abomination of def- desolation upon the altar and build its idols, altars throughout the cities of Judah on every side. Uh, verse 55. And burnt incense at the doors of their houses and in the streets. So they burnt incense at the door of their houses and in the streets, incense to other gods. They were sacrificing idols everywhere. They put the abomination of desolation upon the altar. What made it so abominable, though? They were sacrificing swine flesh on the altar. If you know anything about Torah law, you are not allowed to sacrifice unclean animals on God's altar. Only clean animals can be sacrificed on God's altar by Levites. And in case y'all didn't know, whatever the Levites sacrificed, they had to eat. So that's another reason why you couldn't do that, because they would have to eat pork if it was okay to sacrifice unclean animals on the altar. They would have to turn around and eat it. Right. People don't know these things. So they have defiled the altar. But keep reading. Okay. And when they had rent in pieces the books of the law, which they found. Hold on. They did what to the law? They what did they do to the law? They rent them in pieces. In other words, they launched a Bible destroying campaign. That's what they did. They were walking around ripping up Torah law. Today, that's our Bible. That's what we call the Bible today. It wasn't the complete Bible, but it was the Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi. 
So they ripping up Genesis and Malachi, just carrying it up. Mm-hmm. But go ahead and read it. And when they had rent in pieces the books of the law, which they found, they burnt them with fire. A Bible burning campaign. They burnt the Bibles. They were burning Bibles. Possessing a Bible at that time was a capital punishment, meaning you would be killed. This guy truly is the prototype to the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. But there was another prototype before him, and his name was called Nimrod. Mm -hmm. And we got a whole class showing you about this guy being the first forerunner to the Antichrist. And guess what? That guy was black as the ace of spades. He was Mm -hmm. a Kushite, an Ethiopian. The first prototype to the Antichrist was a black man. But everybody wants you to believe, oh, the Antichrist got to be white. He got to be an Edomite or something. When the first prototype to the Antichrist was Nimrod. That was a black guy. Right. He was a Christite. See, that's what happens when you get all stuck on race. I'm not looking at race. I'm looking at religion. Because most people's religion determine how they view people. It determines their prejudices and, um, and um, favoritism. The religion does. Right? But keep reading. Verse 57, and whosoever was found with any the book of the testament, or if any committed to the law, the king's commandment was that they should be put him to death. You could not do anything written in Torah alone. Anything. You couldn't even sing praises to the Most High God. Couldn't, do, couldn't be done. Was not allowed. Antiochus Epiphany wasn't hearing it. But there are always a group of hardcore believers that's going to book the unfair establishment. And that's what happened back then, too. You had some Hebrew Israelites that folded up like, man, we're just going to go with the program. You know what I'm saying? They started promoting this paganism. But you had a remnant, a select few that said, no, we got to fight against these people. Mm-hmm. We got to take back what is ours. But keep reading. Verse 58, thus did they by their authority unto the Israelites every month to as Every month. They say every month? Every, every month, every month. So they showed up every month doing this. It was a monthly thing. Go ahead and read. To as many as were found in the cities. Mm. Go ahead. Uh, verse 59, now the five and twentieth day of the month, they did sacrifice upon the idol altar, which was upon the altar of God. Which was upon the altar of God. They're sacrificing to pagan gods, unclean animals on God's altar. This really is the abomination of desolation. People don't know this. That's why you need the apocrypha to fill in that gap, to give you that understanding if it tells you that the person who's going to be doing all this stuff who you think is the Antichrist to come in the future is going to come out of the Greek Empire, you know that can't be the Antichrist that comes in the future because he doesn't come out of the Greek Empire. He comes out of the Roman Empire. Antiochus Epiphany came out of the Greek Empire. So go read the book of Daniel, and if you show me that this guy comes from the Greek Empire, I'm not going to buy that it's the Antichrist to come in the future. This guy fits the bill. And this has already been fulfilled. But there's another guy that you can read about also that's going to come later on. You can read that in 2 Thessalonians and in Revelation 13. But this guy is history. But he's just a prototype. He's giving you an, an, an idea of what to expect. And I don't think any one of us want to go through this. But keep reading, please. Verse 60. At which time, according to the commandment, they put to death certain women that had caused their children to be circumcised. But they didn't discriminate by sex, did they, LeBron? Not at all. If you was a woman, they killed you because you had women. They knew the law. Their Antioch's Epiphany set up. They still circumcised their kids, their boys. They still did it. There's a hardcore women out there, too. You had men that were afraid. It just told you that there were men that were afraid. But these women, knowing the penalty for doing this, still did it. And yet you got a lot of Hebrew Israelites want to look down on the, the women in the community today who supported their camp 
and be like, y'all weak. Y'all just need to just sit back, be quiet, don't do nothing. These women were stronger than these men. Mm-hmm. They didn't consent. They didn't fold. They said, look, man, I believe in God. God say circumcise your son on the eighth day. That's what I'm doing. And that's what they did, and they got caught, and they died for it. But keep reading. Verse 61, and they hang the infants about their necks and rifle they did, their house. Hold on, they, hold on. They did what? Hang their infants about their necks? Mm-hmm. That means after they killed the woman, they hung her up some kind of way, and then hung the children up, dead, obviously, and hung the infants around their neck as an example of what not to do. And then it said they rifled their houses, meaning they just went through and they ransacked their houses, and what else they did? And slew them that had circumcised them. And slew them that had circumcised them. So they slew because the women themselves obviously weren't actually the ones doing it. But because they allowed people to circumcise their kids, they got killed for it. The kids got killed for it. And the actual people, which next time would have more than likely been the father of the household or a priest, circumcised, uh, they killed them too. They killed everybody who was involved in this. They didn't play. And all of this, believe it or not, is related to Hanukkah. This is a very important piece of Hebrew and Christian history, and you got people telling you, oh, don't worry about that. Don't bother with that. Hanukkah is pagan. Hanukkah is not in the Bible. We've already proven all of that to be false. Hanukkah was celebrated several times in the Bible before we got to this point. It was just not an official yearly celebration until until then. That's the only thing that changed. And so respected was this celebration that Jesus Christ himself partook of it. That's how respected this celebration was. Not mandatory, but highly respected. So how can you look down or look crazy at anybody who's doing it when your Lord and Savior did it? These people walking around today got such a holier-than-thou attitude. You mean to tell me you're better than Jesus? Jesus used the top torture. That's not even debatable. Read the research. Just do it. Don't listen to me. People seem to get mad at me because it's coming from me. No, it's not coming from me. It's coming through me. If I were to die right now, that research would still be available. That is not stuff that I created. It was not propagated by a creation that I came up with. That's out there. It's always been out there. You just mad at me because I'm the one bringing it to the light. And I'm not the only one. Do the research. But people want to distract you from this stuff. They want to distract me too. Because if they distract me, they're distracting you. Because as long as they keep me distracted and Antoine distracted and LeVar distracted with meaningless debates, then y'all can't learn. Y'all won't know this stuff. And now that y'all are listening, now that I got you ill, now you can say, okay, all of this stuff, okay, it sounds interesting, but is it true? I'm going to go online. I'm going to look up all this stuff, and I'm going to see if everything he's saying is true. And you're going to go online, you're going to see it all, and what's there to argue about? What's there to debate about? The only debate is whether you believe the Bible or not. That's the real debate. We ain't debating over what the Bible says. We're debating over if you actually believe it or not. But um, continue reading. Verse number 62, how be it many in Israel were fully resolved, confirmed in themselves not to eat anything, uh, eat, un, eat any unclean thing. Is it how be it many in Israel were fully resolved and confirmed in themselves not to eat any unclean thing because he was having a mandatory pork eating Festival every month. They said, we're not eating it. We will die rather than go against our God. Sound familiar? Keep reading, please. Wherefore, the rather to die, that they might not be defiled with meat, and that they might not profane the holy covenant. They chose rather to die than to eat pork. And you telling me pork is okay now. 
God's law does not change. Paul can't change God's law. Jesus Christ can't change God's law. He won't do it. He even said himself, I did not come to destroy the law of the prophet. See, if you knew this history, it would be a little harder for Christians to try to get you to believe it's okay to eat pork now when you see what these people went through. You say, well, why would God make pork okay to eat now? The answer, good question. The answer is he didn't. He did not. That's the answer. But we don't know this stuff. People don't want you to look at it. Oh, don't worry about that. Apart. See, he all offered to them extra books. I'm not all offering to none. These books were here long before there was even a thought about a brother Josh. I ain't made up these books. I didn't write these books. They were always here. So don't get mad at ABT because your elder didn't show you this or because these books contradict or expose some falsehood that you've been teaching. Don't get mad at me. So what do they do? They go after the books themselves. They attack the Septuagint. They attack the Apocrypha. They attack Josephus. That's what they do. We don't supposed to do that, though. We supposed to let the Bible be the ultimate authority. We're reading about Hanukkah. All this relates to Hanukkah. We about to get to it. Uh, finish it up, please. Okay, I'm gonna read that again. Wherefore, rather to die that they might not be defiled with meats, and that they might not profane the holy covenant. So then they died. So in then verse, they died. Go ahead. In verse 64 it says, and there was very great wrath upon Israel. And there was very great wrath upon Israel. These guys chose rather to die than to eat pork and break God's covenant. This is what our Hebrew forefathers went through. It's recorded in the Septuagint, which contains the Apocrypha. The Septuagint was the book that originally contained the Apocrypha, not the 1611 KJV. People ask us, why y'all read the Septuagint? Why y'all don't read the 1611 KJV? Because it's telling you 1611, meaning it came long after what we have here. This is more authentic than the 1611. The 1611, there's nothing wrong with it at all. Nothing wrong with it. The Septuagint originally contained the Apocrypha. And it was the Old Testament that was used mainly by New Testament writers, including the apostles and Jesus Christ himself. And believe it or not, you got people out there that want to debate that when every research, every bit of research you do tells you that is the case. See, I've learned something as a teacher, sisters and brothers. It don't matter how concrete something is stated in the Bible or in history or in research, somebody's going to always be there to disagree. Y'all have to understand that there are people in this world that just got a disagreeing spirit on them. Mm-hmm. It don't matter what you show them. It don't matter how much proof you bring to the table. At the end of the day, they're going to still disagree. So if I know that's the type of person I'm dealing with, wouldn't it make me stupid to keep trying to show them something? Mm-hmm. If I know that's the kind of person I'm dealing with, we have to be smarter than that. We can't let pride get in the way and force us to keep trying to win somebody over. The Bible says you have to shake off the dust of your feet after a while. You got to let it go. Okay, brother, you don't believe that? Okay, I mean, whatever. You just don't believe. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next guy. Yep. Not keep badgering the same people. Hey, I want to debate you. I want to debate you. I want to debate you. You're badgering the same people. They already don't believe you. Jesus said, back off. Go on to the next person. Plenty of people out there who want to hear what you have to say. There is. So there are plenty of people out there that want to hear what we got to say. Right? But let's move on. We're still um, in Maccabees. You already um, skip down to verse 50. Um, what we're going to do, I'm sorry, we're going to go to chapter 4. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like you we're going on to chapter 4. Letting you know we got questions. So what? You whenever you're ready, whenever you're ready, you got so a question. Just letting you know we have a question. Thank you. Question. Yeah, whenever you're ready. Okay, um, go ahead. This is a perfect time. This is a perfect time. All right. Well, this is your time, guys. Your time. If you have any questions, you know the number six four six 
Uh, I actually received some emails uh, from some people that they're saying that they tried to call in earlier, but, uh, you know, unfortunately there were some technical difficulties. Uh, it happened in the last show. Once again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. And uh, Blog Talk Radio is working on that. I contacted them, and uh, they're working on those kinks. But I'm hearing, once again, the people that's online can hear the show via Internet. So that's good. At least you guys can hear via Internet. And, uh, you know, let's continue to try to call in, right? Once again, try to call in again. Once again, the number is 646-716-7320. Let's press the number one. And I'll add you into the conversation. What right about now? We're going to go to the people to see what you guys got to say. For those people that are on the phone, I just called in and joined the show. Welcome. Today's show is entitled Hanukkah, the Season of Dedication. Hanukkah, the Season of Dedication. What do you think about this show? Um, my special guest is Absolute Bible Truth, teacher Brother Josh, and students LeVar and Antoine. Let's go to the people. Let's see what they got to say. Uh, 312532. You're live on the Bay Talk you. Shalom, shalom, this brother Moshe in Israel from Chicago. Uh, I will admit this on the air for the world here. I've been listening to this brother Josh for quite a few years now, and I started off really, really not liking this brother because we both come from the Israel of God. I'm from the Israel of God in Chicago. So when I spotted some of his videos on YouTube, I kind of told a whole bunch of brothers here in Chicago, and they kind of gave me a bad taste in my mouth about this brother. And I didn't like him because of it. And I would listen to his stuff just to try to come at him. But I have learned to accept that this brother puts in the work. He studies. And I would like to say this on the air. He probably don't even know this. But uh, I thought bad of him. And I want to tell him across the air to forgive me for my misunderstanding of you. You study, brother. And uh, you can't debate what you're saying tonight. I had a bad taste in my mouth for Hanukkah for years because of what I was taught from the certain class I went to as well. But the way this brother teaches is absolutely stunning to me how he studies. He's not lazy. He studies. And the brothers that come up against him, because I've been listening to your show quite frequently, they always bash his studying. But the book says study and show yourself approved. Don't get mad at him because you're too lazy to go into the books and study for yourself. And I think it's buffoonery to hear brother say um, uh, that's them other books. He ain't going into other books. That's a cop-out. If you don't study, you wouldn't know. And I want to tell this brother, thank you, man, for introducing me to Hanukkah. Now I have a clearer understanding on what it is. And forgive me, brother, for the years you didn't know I was bashing you because of the um, vibe that I got from other brothers that go to the same class that told me about you. Shalom, shalom, and continue the great work and keep studying. I enjoy listening to you, brother. Thank you. I appreciate your call. Brother Josh, you want to reply? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I can just say um, praise God and, you know, um, as I tell everybody, man, I don't hold any grudge against anybody because if you if you look at the um the pattern of people who follow the Messiah, it's always rejection first and acceptance later. And it was the same with me because, like the brother said, we come from the same school of thought. We both come from the Israel of God and Hanukkah and the Apocrypha and quite a other few things are bashed at that place. You know, not to try to put the Israel of God on the spot. And that is the truth. But, I mean, you know, I don't hold any grudges against people. Some people just can't see things now. Here's a little fun fact that I like to put out there. The majority of people at ABT who listens to me now were in opposition to me at one time. You know, I didn't just win people over. People fought me first. I had to fight for almost every listener or every member of ABT that I have. So, you know, ain't no bad blood. You know, praise God, and I'm glad you're enjoying the class. I uh, appreciate your call, my brother, and I uh, appreciate your uh, dedicated uh, caller to the Bay Talk View. Let's go to the next person, 804-289. You're live on the Bay Talk View. Any questions or comments? Um, please tell you about it. Um, I guess I'd be making a comment, right? Now, my experience, right, I don't listen to this, that, and everything, but when I got on the airplane and went over there to Egypt, it blew my mind. 
and I mean, I went up Upper Egypt, and uh, I stayed over there. So I would like for Brother Josh, you know, could he could he add on to this Egypt thing? And uh, uh, Brother Pianki, uh Smash One, because uh, I would like to hear your add on too. So I'm going to go and lean back, you know, to otherwise. I appreciate the call, brother. All right, Brother Josh, you can reply to that. I, I don't really understand what he means when he say add on to this, this Egypt thing. I'm trying to, in what context or, you know, what. 804, you can elaborate. You can elaborate that. Okay. Hey, like, yeah, Brother Josh, now, this is what I experienced, right? What I experienced. I started up. I started up in Alexandria. I went over there to meet the brother Kosh Young and this uh, uh, group, right? And uh, mm-hmm. uh, things didn't work out, right? So, you mm-hmm. know, I the type of brother like everybody else. And you know black people, but you can't tell a black person what to do, man. Your mama can't tell you. <laughs> you know, That's so the truth these, in that. A lot of truth in that. Yeah, man, you know. Things got to be balanced, man. You know, and uh, uh, they got on my first and my last nerve, right? So I had mm-hmm. all, I had already got familiar with Egypt, the York, right? And then I met uh, uh, Walter Williams, right? And I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. my, you know, oh my god, <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know, but what I saw with my eyes, man, you could pull off the uh, uh, Cairo Highway, right, and pull up on a place. Or uh, uh, north of the Giza Plateau, right? Called Abu Wash. Hey, mm-hmm. he ain't got he ain't got to pay nobody a dime to see this, right? You know, I mean, big giant columns and and, and, and you got stuff look like altars, but the uh, minerals is uh, 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 quartz granite. Yeah, that's what I'm working with now. I I don't I don't learn how to shoot shoot signals, right? DC signals, right? Fooling with mm-hmm. that. Yeah, so all that came to me by going to Abu Wash because my experience like, oh, these people messing with some with some serious, you know, off-world of physics, you know. And uh, so when I ran into this to this little battery science thing, I just, I just took to it and just, you know, went from a uh, horse and buggy to, to, to the spaceship. You know, I mean. So what? So let me let me get to understand. So you want me to expound more on Egypt in general, or as it pertains to the Bible? Yes. Where where where? See, the Bible talks so bad about but but Egypt. You know, it it doesn't it, just talk, it don't just talk bad about Egypt. It has some good things to say about Egypt too. But I tell you what, because this is far off the topic of what we're dealing with in a later discussion. Um, I can just found on that on debate talk for you. I will, you know, because I know we got other calls and stuff, and that's a whole broad discussion. But I tell you this much right here: um, I've studied Egyptology for over ten years, including the um, teachings of Doctor York. I'm very well versed in the teachings of Doctor Malachi Z. York, so I know about him. So um, at another time, we'll get with that because that right there is a vast, vast topic. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, once again, you're now listening to Debate Talk Free Radio. The title of the show, Hanukkah, the season of dedication. Hanukkah, the season of dedication. My special guest is Absolute Bible Truth. The number is 646-716-7320. That's 646-716-7320. To those people out there that's letting me know about the uh, technical difficulties with the phone lines, that just lets me know that the listening audience is growing, and it's, you know, it's growing at a rapid pace. And, uh, you know, from time to time, we definitely have that going on with the technical difficulties. But, uh, you know, Blog Talk is working on that right now as we speak. But uh, continue to try to call in. Once again, the number is 646-716-7320. This show is heard all across the globe. So at times we do have uh, technical difficulties when it comes to the servers. But uh, the Blog Talk Radio has assured me that they're working on that ASAP. And, uh, you know, continue to call in. we got more callers on the queue, though. Let's go to the people. Let's see what they got to say. Uh, seven three two nine one four. You're live on the Bay Talk View. I'm on. Yeah, you're on, brother. Live. Mm-hmm. What up, Sal? Hey, what's going on, brother? Jeff, this is Jeff from ABT. Hey, what's up, Jeff? Hey, how you doing, Jeff? What's, what's up, up, man? What's up, Jeff? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, um, great class, brothers. Y'all did a good job. But um, here's the question I got. I mean, you explained thoroughly about, you know, what the Feast of Dedication was for and, you know, how it started. You know, you did a good job on that. But um, my mm-hmm. thing my thing I wanted to ask was, you know, I never celebrated holidays before in my life. You know what I'm saying? Or any holy day. So I just wanted to, you know, could you explain, you know, briefly, you know, to me and, you know, the people who, babes in Christ, who might not be familiar with holy days on what do you do on holy days? Do you eat? Do you give gifts? Um, what do you do? Right. That's no problem at all. Um, the official holy days are written in Leviticus 23, and they are outlined on what you're supposed to do in there, many of which things we cannot do today because we lack the Levites and the temple. But Hanukkah was a holy day that does not require any of those things. Even though it's centered around the temple, there's no commandment for you to be in Jerusalem, even though it was celebrated out of Jerusalem. So we're going to get into later on how they did it. We're going to show you how they did it. I'm going to give you the um the information. We're going to get into that. You're going to see that. Okay, cool. All right, once again, it's the Bay Talk Free Radio. The number is 646-716-7320. That's 646-716-7320. Yeah, right about now, I'm just like multitasking. And people don't know, when I do this show, I'm like on Facebook, and the chat room, Twitter. I'm doing all kinds of stuff right now. So <laughs> and I'm seeing the people responses right now. A lot of people liking the show on uh, Twitter, Facebook. So once again, I appreciate the support out there uh, listening to Debate Talk for you. Let's go to the next person, um, 404-993. You're live on Debate Talk for you. Shabbat shalom, fellas. How y'all doing? Hey, Shabbat shalom. This man with DeAndre. The giant. You know. There he is. <laughs> What's up, General? You know I'm always calling in and telling you to keep that 12 pack going. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, I just want to say this to the listening audience, man. You know, anytime and that, that other call that called in, the guy from Chicago. I mean, that's 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 one of the. Uh, great examples of, of a guy calling in and, and retracting and humbling himself and coming in and, and saying it's not wrong for, you know, going off of what somebody else has said about another guy. And I just want to say this. Anytime another quote-unquote camp or another teacher or whatever got to bash another teacher's teachings because that guy's bringing out truth to try to frame your mindset, you need to check yourself, first of all, for listening to whoever it is that's giving you information and trying to turn you away from a guy or a true man of the most high to try to turn it, to try to keep you from getting true revelation and finding out that the one that's telling you that the other individual, such as Josh, is a false teacher or whatever they said, to, they're trying to mask the deception to show that they are the ones that's in error. I just want to mm-hmm. say to y'all out there that's listening, be mindful of that, that when people are trying to divert your attention from the truth, it's because you're going to find out that the one that's trying to divert your attention is the, the one that's anti-Christ. That's, why, that's what I call it, anti-Christ. You follow what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. a, true, a, true, a true man in the most high, such as this brother here who I know, who Josh, a true man like that, and I know he's a true a, a, a laborer. He's a workman, like 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 Timothy said when he Paul told Timothy, study the church of approval. A workman, you look that word workman up. That's a laborer. That's a toiler. That's one that's astute in his studies. That's what a teacher is. And I know this brother mm-hmm. personally. I know this brother, so I know this brother is astute. You follow what I'm saying? I know he's an astute. I know he come on the show. I know he love y'all out there. I know he wants y'all to understand the truth. So I'm just saying, when somebody's trying to Try to divert your attention from listening to a true man like a true brother like Josh. Listen, this brother is this brother is is, is a student. What he's doing? He's gonna come on here and he's not gonna give y'all no anything. He don't just make loose statements. I know this. So, you know, I just want to say, Josh, keep up the good work. Levar, Antoine, y'all keep up the good work. And uh, and I'm, I'm sitting back. I'm drinking. <laughs> he meant spirit. He meant spiritually, sisters and brothers. He meant spiritually. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I clear, yeah, I clear that one up. Right 
that's why I had to clear that one up. <laughs> you know, just in case, just in case yeah. somebody just happened to um, come on at the last minute and heard him say that, oh, Mr. DeAndre straight getting drunk. You know, nah, that ain't what he meant. He's about, metaphorically speaking, he's drinking of this sweet word of God that we're bringing. And praise God, too, for the admonishment, um, Minister DeAndre, and uh, debate talk for you audience. Look forward to a show that um, Minister DeAndre and myself have coming, um, Death and the Afterlife. Um, yes, very deep topic. It's going to be a two-night event. Uh, what were those dates again, Sal? It's in December. What is that? The, um, what are those yeah, dates? That's gonna, yeah, that's gonna yeah, it's going to actually be uh, Thursday, December 19th, and Friday, December 20th. Uh, you don't want to miss that show. So it's going to be two back-to-back lessons on Debate Talk for you. That's going to be, once again, Thursday, December 19th, and Friday, December the 20th. So make sure you check that out. And uh, once again, I appreciate you uh, for, for calling in, uh, definitely. Once again, you're now listening to Debate Talk for you. This is your time, guys. If you have any questions or comments, you know the number, 646-716-7320, 646-716-7320. you got to do is press number one. And, of course, I'll add you into the conversation. The show is all about the listening audience, interaction with the special guests, as well as the listeners of this show. Once again, I want to thank my Debate Talk for You team out there. They're interacting with the people as well, helping me out. You know, a lot of people are pressing that like button. They, you know, they're sharing it all over social media. Once again, once again, let your people know. You know, share this thing all over Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Let people know that Debate Talk for You is live on the air. <laughs> Let's go to the next person here. Uh, 315-399. You're live on Debate Talk for You. Hi, Shabbat Shalom. This is Erica about Yisrael. Hey, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, sister. Hi. Okay, my question was about the Hanukkah lights, the lighting of the candles. Is that anywhere in the Bible? Did they did the oil burn for eight days? Is that anywhere in there? That's not mentioned in there, but it is mentioned in the book of Josephus. That's why it's also called the Festival mm. of Lights. One of the names for Hanukkah is the Festival of Lights, and that is the manure that they're um mm-hmm. they're actually lighting the um the candles on, you know, for eight days or whatever. So that's what that comes from right there. That's why it's also called the Festival of Lights. Okay. And should we be doing that? Well, it's like optional. There's like nothing wrong with doing it. There's nothing nothing wrong with doing it. See, Hanukkah in itself is an optional holy day. It's not mandatory. It's mm-hmm. optional. I'm just showing people there is a significant part of Hebrew and Christian history as well as the fact that I'm going to show in a moment that the Messiah observed it and it has spiritual significance behind it. But what they mainly did, just they just feasted and celebrated and had mirth, which I'm going to read that to you, for eight days, mm-hmm. and they visited the temple in Jerusalem. That's how the common people did. They just came to the temple to see the temple and show support for the temple. That's how they celebrated Hanukkah, the common people. And, of course, the Levites did sacrifices, which they had daily sacrifices anyway. Okay, okay. Appreciate your Okay, that, that makes more sense now. Thank you. Praise God. Well, appreciate your call. Once again, you're listening to Debate Talk Free Radio. The title of this show, Hanukkah, the season of dedication. Hanukkah, the season of dedication. The number is 646-716-7320. For the first-time listeners out there, uh, make sure you go to the website, www.blogtalkradio.com slash debate talk for you. And you can look below in the description box, and you'll see the links to my special guest social media pages, their uh, Bible study classes, and all the information you need to contact these brothers of absolute Bible truth. So make sure you go to the website, www.blogtalkradio.com slash debate talk for you. Scroll down and click on the show, Hanukkah. Of the season of dedication. Let's go to the people. Let's see what we got to say. Got more people that with questions. Three one five four one four. You're live on the Bay Talk for you. Hey, Shalom, brother Sal, uh, brother Josh, brother Lavar, brother Antoine, this is brother Ben Trey from Syracuse, and I want to say Shalom to Erica and Shaala. You know my brothers in the three one five area. Um, brother Josh, I just got a quick question. Um, I was trying to do some research a while back. Are the biblical incense the same incense we have that they sell now in the stores? Uh, I can't really say. You would have to go and look at the ingredients of the incense in the stores and see if the Bible lists any particular incense ingredients pertaining to the incense, you know, um, in the Bible, that's used in the Bible. You know what I'm saying? But even so, it really doesn't make a difference because incense at that time in history was used for fragrant and worship, while you may just have some incense around your house for just the 
you know, fragrance of the house. That don't mean you're worshiping God with them or you're worshiping a pagan God. They're just a form of, uh, you know, uh, giving a nice aroma to your home. So it doesn't have to be the same ingredients used for, um, you know, that they use in the Bible days. And excuse me, even if it was, you wouldn't be allowed to do it anyway because the burning of the incense and the lighting of the incense, that was all done by the Levites. That's what John the Baptist's father was, I believe, Zacharias. That was his job. He was um, lighting the incense, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, then I, and I have one more question. Um, it's kind of off topic. I'm not sure if you'll answer it, but where it says uh, in the law that you shouldn't kindle a fire on the Sabbath day, um, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Like, I know a lot of people say you can't cook or, like, a fire or the forest. I'm not really sure. So I'm not mm -hmm. trying to study on if you can give me some insight. Well, what you have to do is you have to go back to the law where the Sabbath requirements are mentioned. There are only two requirements in the Sabbath law. Um, holy convocation, which means a holy gathering, you know, an assembly. In other words, we call that having church or having a study that's mandatory on the Sabbath day, optional on other days of the week, mandatory on the Sabbath. And also not doing any work, unless, of course, work that pertains to the ministry, not doing any work. So if it tells you not to kindle a fire, on the Sabbath, it has to fall under the categories of either your holy convocation being uh, messed up or are you working, and that's also breaking the Sabbath. You have to ask yourself then, how would killing the fire be a form of work? Well, back in those days, you got to ask yourself, what did they have to do to start a fire? It took a lot of work. They had to rub up sticks together, or they had to go out and gather the wood, cut down some trees and stuff. So it's pertaining to the work. There is no law in the Bible specifically that dismisses a fire kindling on the Sabbath. The word kindle means to burn, but it said don't kindle the fire. That means start a fire. So it has to be related to work. So that's why they said don't kindle the fire on the Sabbath. That falls under the category of working. Don't work the labor involved in doing it. All right. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And good class. Praise God. I appreciate your call, brother. Once again, this is your time, guys. This is your time. If you have any questions or comments, call in or forever hold your peace. <laughs> the number is 646-716-7320. Uh, for those people that's having difficulty calling in, I'm, I'm seeing your messages. I'm seeing, you know, all of the replies, saying that people are having problems calling in. Uh, try Skype. You can call in uh, via Skype. Once again, just use the number, 646-716-7320. Press the number 1. And hopefully that works out for you guys. I want to apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, you know, uh, they're working on it as we speak. But, you know, I see a couple callers call, uh, calling in. So, you know, keep trying, brothers. Keep trying. Once again, I love hearing from the people. The number is 646-716-7320. Let's go to the people. See what they got to say. 513-307. You're live on the air. Hey, shalom. Shalom, Sal. Shalom, uh, brother Josh Lavar. It's uh, Yahshua, Israel now. Hey, what's going on, bro? Hey, Shalom. I was actually just calling to uh, uh, I can't hear him. Can y'all hear him? Yeah, oh, uh, yeah, 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 sure. You went low a little bit, but uh, say that one more time. Say it one more time. Can you hear me a little better now? Yeah, yeah, there you yeah, go. yeah, yeah. You're good better. now. We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. All right, I just turned my phone up. Well, pretty much, uh, most of the people that I've talked to, like over the years, as far as um people that had a negative view of Hanukkah, it was always because they they look at what the people in Judaism do, and they relate mm -hmm. that, and they think that you're following Judaism when you're not. I mean, it's right in the New Testament. I think you. I heard you say earlier you was going to bring that verse out, so I didn't want to say anything and just let you bring it out later. But, I mean, it's clearly mm -hmm. in the New Testament scripture, so we shouldn't have a problem with it when we see it there. But most of the people, when they see, you know, we celebrate Hanukkah and things like that, and it's like you said, it's not a mandatory thing. You can do it if you want to. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But I think it's a great thing to do. Um, but but basically, I think that's the view that they look at it, is they're letting someone else take what's really ours. You know, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. I appreciate your call, Brother Josh. Want to reply? Uh, yeah, I mean, the brother is absolutely right. That's the same thing I was saying pretty much the whole class, that we let people – um, you know, cloud our views of things that, you know, we want to learn and see. Just like the brother who called there from Chicago named Moshe who said a lot of people, 
put try to put tried to put a negative um taste in his mouth concerning me and they succeeded. But, you know, thanks be to the Most High God, the brother was a sincere brother. And when you're a sincere brother, it doesn't matter if you hate somebody in the beginning. The Most High is going to lead you to the truth. And if that brother you originally hated is teaching you the truth, then you're going to start to love that brother. You know what I'm saying? Because you love God and you love his word. But that's all I got to say to that. All right. Once again, this is your time, guys. You know the number six four six seven one six seven three two zero. 646 Um. I don't see any more callers on the switchboard right now. That's pressing number one. But I see a lot of people listening to the show. And once again, I appreciate you guys for uh, checking out the Bay Talk View and, uh, you know, checking out this particular lesson. Uh, once again, those people that's having difficulty calling, you can use your Skype, guys. For the first time listeners, if you didn't know, you can actually use Skype to call into the show as well uh, by dialing the number, 646-716-7320. Try to Skype, press the number one, and let's, let's, hopefully that works out for you guys. All right, guys. Uh, there's nobody else on the queue right now that's well, pressing number one. Uh, later on, of course, if you have any questions, uh, people, just press number one, and I'll add you into the conversation. Brother Josh, you can go ahead. All right, let's keep it moving. You know me, Sal. I like to clear the switchboard before I move on. So, you know, let's go to um, let's go to uh, First Maccabees chapter four, Levar, and mm-hmm. we're gonna read when this dedication or this Hanukkah was first instituted as a state or a national holy day, right? So this 4th Maccabees, because you had this guy named Matthias, and he was the leader of this um, this revolution against the Greek Empire and Antiochus Epiphany, and he had five sons. One of his sons were named Judas Maccabees, and the word Maccabees means hammer. So he was called Judas or Judah the hammer, and he selected him to um, take his place once, you know, Matthias died, once the father Matthias died. So Judah actually drove out the Greek invaders and took back the temple. And let's see what happened when he did that. This is 4th Maccabees, if you're reading in the Septuagint, um, chapter, chapter 4 and um, verse 41, 1st Maccabees, chapter 4. And we're going to start reading it. Um, let me get here first. Let me get here. Fourth Maccabees. Fourth Maccabees. I'm sorry, my bad. First Maccabees. I keep saying first, first, fourth is first Maccabees because there is a fourth Maccabees in the Apocrypha. There's first Maccabees, chapter Maccabees. four, okay. verse 41. It's on page 149. These Roman numerals, sister brother, y'all got to forgive me. Yeah, let me just jump in real quick, Josh. Hold on for a second. Uh, those people that already asked the question, do me a favor. Just press the number one once again. If you already asked the question, just press the number one, and that'll take you off the switchboard and bring other people up with uh, questions. So do me that favor, guys. If you already asked the question, just press the number one one more time, and that'll take you off the switchboard and bring other people further up on the switchboard that didn't ask any questions. Or if you want to ask another question, uh, press the number one twice. Go okay, ahead, Brother Josh. Okay. Um, this is First Maccabees chapter four and verse forty one. It's on page one forty nine in the Septuagint, Lavar. Uh, go ahead and read. It says here that Judas appointed certain men to fight against those that were in the fortress until he had cleansed the sanctuary. Until he had cleansed the sanctuary, he drove all those Greek invaders out. What else? Verse forty two. So he chose priests of blameless conversation, such has had pleasure in the law, mm-hmm. who cleanse the sanctuary and bear out the defiled stones into an unclean place. So we know they're starting over. You have seen the pattern, sisters and brothers. You know what is going to happen because God works in patterns. And if somebody goes outside of the pattern, you know they are not of God. So we've seen already on three previous occasions when they first had the tabernacle, uh, constructed, they had to have a dedication of the altar. When the temple was first built, Solomon's temple, they had to have a dedication of the altar. After Solomon's temple was destroyed and they had to rebuild it, they had to have a dedication of the altar. So now this temple has been partly destroyed and the altar has been defiled. So what is going to come next? The dedication of the altar, which comes into our language as Hanukkah. 
Hanukkah was being celebrated for centuries before we got here, though. We already knew that. But I had to take y'all there first to work y'all way up to this. Because many people don't know this. Like the brother who called in, say, people associate Hanukkah with Judaism. See them so-called Jews? That's something they made of. No, our Hebrew forefathers made this up, sisters and brothers. It didn't come from them. They just adopted it from us. That's what they did. This is our national holy day. It belongs to us. And it was created, this is the only holy day other than the Feast of Purim, that was created by Hebrew Israelites that God never really had a problem with because it wasn't associated with paganism or nothing. You follow what I'm saying? This is a national holy day that commemorates our Hebrew forefathers released from foreign Greek invaders. But continue reading, um, LeVar. Verse 44 and when they consulted what to do with the altar of burnt offerings, which was profane, they thought it best to pull it down, lest it should be a reproach to them, because the heathen had defiled it. So they wanted to get rid of that old altar. They said, you know what, it's been defiled so much, we're just going to carry it down. We don't want it anymore. Go ahead and read. Wherefore, they pulled it down. Verse 46, and laid it down in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place until there should come a prophet to show what should be done with them. Okay, read verse 47. Go ahead. Then they took whole stones according to the law and built a new altar according to the former. Now, they said they built a new altar, right? Because the old altar was so defiled, they didn't even want to use it anymore. They said, we're just going to tear that down. We're going to start over. That's what they're doing. They're starting over. So now let's see what they're going to do. Now skip down to verse 56 and read verse 56 to 59. Go ahead. Verse 56. And so they kept the dedication of the altar eight days. Wait a minute, LaVar. Stop, 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 LaVar. Did we read that in the book of Second Chronicles 7? Yeah. Did, did we also read that in Ezra chapter 6? Yep. yep. Did, we, did, did we read that in Exodus 25 and Exodus 27 and Numbers chapter 7? Didn't we read that already? Mm-hmm. Yep. So why do everybody look all crazy when we tell people we are keeping the dedication or Hanukkah when your own Bible shows you that the Hebrew Israelites had been doing this for centuries? It's not new. It said they kept the dedication of the altar. It even has the word dedication here because that's the word translated. That's the translation, dedication. The transliteration would be Shanutha or Hanukkah. But the translation means when you take a word and you give its definition in another language. A transliteration is when you try to write that word in another language. That's the difference. So this right here is the translation. That's what it means, dedication. So it says they kept the dedication of the what, Lamar? They kept the dedication of the altar. Remember I told y'all at the beginning of this class, pay attention to the altar because it's going to keep coming back up. They're keeping the dedication of the altar. In other words, they are observing Chanukah, Hanukkah but it had already been done several times before in Israel's history. But because people don't want to look up these words, they want to remain ignorant. They don't know this. And then when somebody like me come on the scene and a few others say, hey, man, you know, we celebrated Hanukkah this year. Hanukkah, y'all, what y'all trying to copy them folk out? You? Hanukkah is pagan. No, it isn't. <laughs> it's been in your Bible the whole time. Yep. But, but but keep reading. And so they kept the dedication of the altar eight days and offered burnt offerings with gladness and sacrificed the sacrifice of deliverance and praise. Hold on, ain't that what they did? That's the same thing we read in Ezra and in Second Chronicles. Same the same thing. thing we read. It ain't uh-huh. different at all. But here's the only difference. Go ahead and read. They decked also the forefront of the temple with crowns of gold and with shields and the gates and the chambers they renewed and hanged doors upon them. Thus, 
was there very great gladness among the people, for that the reproach of the heathen was put away. Hanukkah Moreover, is a eight day celebration of mirth and gladness, celebrating the Hebrew Israelites' release from the foreign Greek invaders. That's what it is. But it's spiritual too. Because they rededicated, excuse me, they rededicated the temple. It had already been dedicated during the time of Ezra. But when they came to find it, they had to rededicate it. You follow what I'm saying? But continue reading. And this way it became a national holy day. Go ahead and read. Moreover, Judas and his brethren with the whole congregation of Israel ordained that the days of dedication of the altar should be kept in their season from year to year by the space of eight days, from the five and twentieth day of the month of Kaslu with mirth and gladness. So they made it an official holy day. It's not a mandatory holy day. They made it an official holy day. And people respected, the Hebrew Israelites respected and reverenced this holy day so much that it was still being observed during the time of Jesus Christ, and he himself observed it. Because the way you observe Hanukkah as a regular person was by simply visiting the temple. That's all you did. Because it was about the temple being taken back from foreign invaders. So now, let's go to the New Testament, Antoine. Let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to John chapter 10. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to do some research. I couldn't start it off here. No, I wanted to spoon feed you all the way here. So now you got the whole history from Old Testament to Apocrypha to New Testament. Who can dispute this? You cannot dispute this. John chapter 10. And read verses 22 and 23, Antoine. John chapter, John chapter 10, 10. John chapter 10, mm-hmm. verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. Wait a minute. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of dedication, and it was winter. Somebody showed me in Leviticus 23 where it speaks of a feast of dedication. Can't do it. You cannot do it. And it says it was winter. No holy day, mandatory holy day falls in the winter. So you know you can't try to say, well, it's tabernacle. Tabernacle don't fall in the winter. <laughs> and it's not memorial blowing the trumpet. So here's a little tidbit for people who want to kick against the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the only book at this time in history that contained the Apocrypha. So if John is recording the Feast of Dedication in his book, where did he get the information from, my boy, that's why? From the Septuagint. The Septuagint. So how are you going to try to tell me that the apostles did not use the Septuagint when a, when a holy day that can only be found in the Septuagint appears in your New Testament? <laughs> All right. Mm. That's why I say it's stupid to debate about the Septuagint. That is stupid. Why would I debate you about that when you can't show me the piece of dedication anywhere in your Bible and I just went in the Septuagint and showed it to you? And you're going to try to tell me, oh, they didn't use the Septuagint. They didn't use the Septuagint. Then where in the world did John get the idea of a feast of dedication from? It's not in our Bible. Where did he get it from? And it, said, it was winter. If you go back and read First Maccabees, that happened in the month Chislu, or Chislu, which corresponds to our December or late November. That's what that corresponds to. That's wintertime, sisters and brothers. The last holy day on the Hebrew calendar falls in the month Tishri, and that corresponds to fall season. So this cannot be tabernacle. That's like a September, October type thing. All right. So this is the Feast of Dedication. Let's see what Jesus was doing. Continue reading. John ten twenty three, And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. And he walked in the temple on Solomon's porch. What is he doing walking in the temple? That's how they observed Hanukkah. It was about the dedication of the temple. So they went and they visited the temple. Some people went inside of it. So Jesus is demonstrating how they observed the holy day Hanukkah. And you trying to tell me, let's all celebrate Hanukkah. That's pagan. And 
your Lord and Savior celebrated it. So I guess Jesus was a pagan. That's how they celebrated it. In fact, the mandatory holy days that required you to be in Jerusalem, you had to go to the temple because you had to take your sacrifice to the Levites so they can make an offering. That's why I said three times in a year shall all males appear before the Lord in the place he shall choose the place his name, which was Jerusalem, and you shall not appear before me empty. All holy days that required you to be in Jerusalem also required you to visit the temple. So when he went to the dedication, he visited the temple. He went inside the temple. That's how they observed Hanukkah. That's how regular people did. They visited the temple. So Jesus Christ is observing Hanukkah. This is in your New Testament. Somebody, anybody who's listening in, they got a problem with the Apocrypha or got a problem with the Septuagint, please tell me why your Lord and Savior is celebrating a holy day that can only be found in the Apocrypha. These people don't know what they're up against. You don't know who you're dealing with. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about this word. This is the feast of dedication. And just to prove to y'all even further that this is talking about Hanukkah, I have not one, not two, not three, not four, but five different Bible dictionaries we're going to read from that's going to validate that. That should be enough for even the most stubborn Hebrew Israelite. Yeah. That should be enough. I'm not making this stuff up. I don't have to make anything up. You have been lied to. They don't want you listening to me because they don't want you to know the truth. This is a very significant holy day to such a degree that your Lord and Savior observed it. He was there. He went into the temple. That's how you celebrate Hanukkah, by visiting the temple. And he went in it. And like I told y'all, every time Jesus did any holy day in the New Testament, every time he observed it, he dropped some kind of spiritual truth on the people, right? But first, what we're going to do, we're going to go to the Smith Bible Dictionary on the Feast of Dedication, right? Let's see what it says, because I'm going to prove to y'all what this is, and we're going to read it. We're going to let the research tell it, because for some reason, when I show research, people think I'm just making stuff up. This is the Smith Bible Dictionary on the Dedication. It says Dedication Feast of, look what it says. The festival instituted to commemorate the purging of the temple and the rebuilding of the altar under Judas Maccabeus, I mean, after Judas Maccabeus had driven out the Syrians, B.C. 154. Then again, the reference, 1 Maccabees 4, 52 through 59. Look what else it says. It is named only once in the canonical scriptures, John 10, at 22? You mean to tell me your Bible, di- their, their Bible dictionary is telling you it's referring to Hanukkah? But somebody right. tell me if we're supposed to be reading the Apocrypha, if we're supposed to be dealing with the Septuagint, if the, the disciples didn't read the Septuagint, how in the world did they know about Hanukkah? When it's only written in those books. How did they know? Better yet, why was all of Israel celebrating something that could only be found in the Apocrypha? If they all of Israel wasn't using the Apocrypha, mm. they all were doing it. That's why the Jews were there right there with them. He wasn't in the temple by himself. They were right there with him. Why? Because they were there for the Feast of Dedication. But look what else it says right here. Let's see what else it says about it. It says, it commenced on the 25th of Chislu, early in December, right? And this is early in December because it lasts for eight days. And we ain't got nothing but like, what, two more days left in this month? You know what I'm saying? One, right? So that would be early December, right? The anniversary of the pollution of the temple by Antiochus Epiphany, B.C. 157. Look how I just give you all this information. This is exactly what we just read, ain't it? Right? Look what else it says. Right, the great Mosaic feast, it lasted eight days, but it did not require attendance at Jerusalem like the other holy days do. It says, um, it was an occasion of much festivity and was celebrated in nearly the same manner as the Feast of Tabernacles with the carrying of branches of trees, just for the question, or uh, answer the question of the person that asked how were they doing it, right? With the carrying of branches of trees and with much singing. In the temple at Jerusalem, the Hallel was sung every day of the feast. 
So there's one reference telling you that the Feast of the Dedication is referring to a holy day that you can only find in the Apocrypha. But you're telling me, put the Apocrypha down and it's mentioning your Lord and Savior observing a holy day that can only be found in the Apocrypha, which can only be found in the Septuagint. And you're telling me, leave the Septuagint alone. Huh. So you're doubly trying to deceive me. And then got the audacity to say, you want to debate about this. There is no debating this. It is what it is. Either you believe it or you don't. You follow what I'm saying? That's like me trying to convince you that water is wet. <laughs> I mean, come on. That's a given. Water is wet. Either you believe it or you don't. But I'm not going to spend three hours trying to make you believe that. But let's go to another reference. That was the first reference. Let's go to reference number two. This is the Holman's Bible Dictionary. This is actually under the title Hanukkah. Look what it says. The other post exilic holiday, that means after the children of Israel uh, went to captivity in Babylon, the other post exilic holiday was Hanukkah, a festival which began on the 25th day of Kislev, December, you know, early December, and lasted eight days. Josephus referred to it as the Feast of Lights because a candle was lighted each successive day until a total of eight was reached. So let's make that six references, because if Josephus refers to it, that's a six reference. Am I right, fellas? Yeah, that's you're right. right. So that's six references, not five. That's six. Let's keep reading, right? It says, um, it says the festival commemorates the victories of Judas Maccabeus in 167 B.C., at that time, when temple worship was reinstituted after an interruption of three years, a celebration of eight days took place. The modern celebration does not greatly affect the routine duties of everyday life. This feast is referred to in John 10 and 22, where it is called the Feast of Dedication. See that? they all telling you that Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. They're all telling you that John 10 and 22 is talking about Hanukkah. That is not found in your King James Version Bible. So where did they get it from? They got it from the Septuagint, which contains the Apocrypha. And if, all, if it was a state holy day, if all of Israel was celebrating it, that means all of Israel had to be using the Septuagint and the Apocrypha. Isn't that common sense, S1 and Levant? Very common that's common sense. And yet you got a brother or some brothers out here that actually want to debate us about this. The Bible talks about people who are full of debate, meaning they're not debating us to try to get to some central truth. They just want to debate. And that's why I tell you no, because this cannot be debated. Like the brother from, Mo, from uh, Chicago named Mose said, this stuff cannot be debated. You just don't want to accept it. That's between you and the most high. Don't try to drag ABT into that. I don't want nothing to do with that. We don't want anything to do with that. But let's go to another thought. Let's go to Easterns. Bible Dictionary. See, people think we just uh, don't be knowing what we're talking about. We're just making stuff up. We're not making this stuff up. This is Easterns Bible Dictionary, the third source. On the dedication feast of the. Look what the first thing it tells you, John 10 and 22. That's the first thing you Look what it says, i.e., the feast of renewing. Hmm, that's different, the feast of renewing. We're going to get into that that's the spiritual part of it. It was instituted in 164 B.C. to commemorate the purging of the temple after its pollution by Antiochus Epiphanes, 167 B.C., and the rebuilding of the altar after the Syrian invaders had been driven out by Judas Maccabeus. It lasted for eight days, beginning on the 25th of the month, Chislu, December, which was often a period of heavy rains. It was rains. It was an, an occasion of much rejoicing and festivity. No matter what Bible dictionary you look up, it's going to tell you that the Feast of Dedication is Hanukkah, and it's right there in your Bible with your Messiah celebrated. So if Jesus Christ celebrated it, why in the world would you look at us like we're crazy when we do it? 
because you are ignorant. You have no understanding. You don't know what you're up against. You just want to debate somebody. You just want some glory. Hey, I want to be the guy that took out ABT. This isn't a content, sisters and brothers. This is truth. If you don't want to believe the research, fine. Stay in your little box. Stay in your little bubble. That's your business. We ain't trying to take that away from you, but don't try to drag us into it either. All right. Let's go to another. Let's go to the fourth source. We're going to the faucet Bible Dictionary. It's called the faucet Bible Dictionary. It's the faucet. Look what it says under um dedication, feast of. Look at the first thing it gives you. John 10 and 22, in winter, about our December, which is now is about our December, look what it gives you. First Maccabees 4, 52 through 59, and second Maccabees 10 and 5. Look what it says. Commemorating the purging of the temple and the building of the altar after Judas Maccabees had driven out the Syrians, 164 B.C. It began on the 25th of Chislu, December, the anniversary of Antiochus Epiphany's pollution of the temple, 157 B.C. Lasted eight days, celebrated like the Feast of Tabernacles, tabernacles with much joy and singing and with carrying of branches. The Hallel was sung in the temple daily. The feast was called light, and there was much illumination of houses. The dedication of the second temple, the second temple, Temple was on the third of Adar, Ezra 6, 15 through 16, dead of Solomon's temple at the Feast of Tabernacles, 1 Kings 8 and 2, and 2 Chronicles 5 and 3. So this dictionary is even telling you that this was not the first dedication, which I've been telling y'all all all night. They were already celebrating Hanukkah. It just did not become an official holy day until Judas Maccabees made it that. Let's go to one last source. We got one more scripture after that, and that's it. We're going to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Five sources, sisters and brothers, compared to the zero that our opposition going to bring that try to refute this. Five. You follow what I'm saying? Put the Bible itself. Five sources and the Bible itself, and you're going to still have an idiot out there that's going to try to debate it. We ain't got time for them. We don't have time for them. I'm only interested in people who are seeking the truth. I'm not going to debate somebody who doesn't agree. If you just don't agree, fine. But you ain't going to waste my time disagreeing with me about something that just really cannot be refuted. You're not going to tell me they didn't use the Septuagint when the feast of dedication is only found in the Septuagint. What happened with Judas Maccabees happened like 200 years earlier. So they had to have a record of what happened. That record is called the Apocrypha, and that book is called First and Second Maccabees. And that's how they knew. That's when that holy day was established during that time, which means they had to be using the Septuagint, which contained the Apocrypha. And you trying to tell me the New Testament writers didn't use the Septuagint when all of Israel, including Jesus Christ himself, and you know Jesus Christ did it, his apostles did it, because they followed him everywhere he went, and they did what he did. So you mean to tell me all of these people were celebrating Hanukkah, but neither one of them got it from the Septuagint, which contained the Apocrypha? How stupid do you think these people are? Hmm. But this is the last source. This is the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia on the dedication feast of. First thing it gives you, John 10 and 22, a feast held by the Jews throughout the country, throughout the country, right? It isn't saying in Jerusalem. It says throughout the country for eight days, commencing on the 25th Kislev, December, in commemoration of the cleansing of the temple and the dedication of the altar by Judas Maccabeus after their desecration by Antiochus Epiphany. First Maccabees 4, 56, and then it says 59. The feast was to be kept with mirth and gladness. Reference, Second Maccabees 10, 6, and 7. I'm sorry, Second Maccabees 10, 6, and 7 says, it was kept like the Feast of Tabernacles 
with the carrying of palm and other branches and the singing of psalms. Josephus calls it light from the joy which accompany it. And here's the thought in Josephus. That's Antiquities 12.7.7. So that's six sources that I've given. Not five, six. At this winter feast, Jesus delivered in the temple the discourse recorded in John 10.24 at Jerusalem. So they said it was at this feast. He was there, meaning he was celebrating. He gave his discourse that you can read in John 10 and 24. So that means he was there commemorating it. It said it was kept throughout the country. Jesus Christ observed Hanukkah. I said a lot of y'all didn't even know that. He observed Hanukkah. And it can only be found in the Septuagint, which contain the Apocrypha. And now it can be found in regular Apocrypha now because they separated from the Septuagint, and now you can just buy the Apocrypha by itself. But let's go to the last one, 2 Corinthians 6. Now let's get the spiritual significance behind it because they tried to put idols in the temple. Judas Maccabeus cleansed the idol from the temple and rededicated it back to the Most High God of Israel. This is the season of dedication, sisters and brothers, meaning there's symbology behind that. It's symbolism behind that. 2 Corinthians 6, Levar, if you will. 14 through 18. Let me know what you get, though. Second Corinthians. Go ahead and read, please. Verse 14. But ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That means don't be on one accord with unbelievers. Go ahead and read. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communication has light with darkness? And what con- what concord has Christ with Belial? Belial. What co- concord have Christ with Belial? That's a, another name for Satan. What concord has Christ with Belial? Go ahead and read. Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? An infidel means unbeliever. You hear Muslim extremists say that word most of the time. When they say infidel, it just means unbeliever. So what part have he that believes with an unbeliever? Well, watch what it says right here. Go ahead. And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? And what agreement have the temple of God with idols, which, go ahead. For ye are the temple of the living God. For ye are the temple of the living God. He's talking to the Christian church, the true Christian church, not this Sunday crap you see. The true Christian church. He said, ye are the temple of the living God. Right now, sisters and brothers, we don't have a physical temple. We are God's temple. We do not supposed to have anything to do with idols, which the rest of the world is going to be dealing with in about the next 26 or 27 days. With the Christmas tree and the wreath. And the Yule log and all that other stuff. Those are all idols. We are the temple of God, just like Judas Maccabees cleared the temple of all of the idols in the wintertime. Remember, we looked up at that, the festival of renewing. To renew something means to make it new again. We as the people should reflect on Hanukkah as a time for rededication to the Most High God of Israel. Whatever area we lack in, notice it falls in the winter. What happens to things in the winter? That's the end. Everything dies. Everything withers. And then after winter, you start over with spring. Hanukkah is a time of rededication. It's a time for you as the temple of God to dedicate yourself once again to God, after you have removed everything that's an that's an abomination to God 
from your temple. Finish that, please. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Mm-hmm. That's verse 16. That's it. I'll read verse 17. Go ahead. I want to put this out. Go ahead. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Go ahead. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. It said, wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate. Because we are the temple of God, sisters and brothers, until God sets up another physical temple. We are the temple of God. We are supposed to have any fellowship with unbelievers. That's defiling God's temple. We are supposed to get these idols out of God's temple. That is what Hanukkah commemorates, the cleansing and renewing of God's temple at the end of the year. So for y'all, sisters and brothers, as Christians, the spiritual significance is we are supposed to reflect on this and understand that we are the temple of God and we are supposed to get these idols and all uncleanliness from us, from our temple, because only then can you truly dedicate yourself to the Most High God of Israel? Thank you for listening. All right, once again, this is your time, guys. Your time to let your voice be heard. You know the number, 646-716-7320. Once you call in, it's press number one, and I'll gladly add you to the conversation. Uh, for those people that just joined into the show, the title of the show Hanukkah, the season of dedication. Hanukkah, the season of dedication. If you happen to miss any part of the show, the show is archived. So make sure you go to the website, www.blogtalkradio.com, slash debate talk for you. Scroll down and click on the show that says Hanukkah, the season of dedication. My special guest is Absolute Bible Truth. Once again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to call in and press the number one, and I'll add you to the conversation. And I want to give a shout-out to the... Brother Pianca, Daily Tribe, uh, currently in the chat room right now, dropping that knowledge, chopping it up right now in the chat room. Appreciate your uh, you know, interaction right now, debate talk for you. You know, a lot of people tune in via Internet and they uh, chop it up in the chat room. So for those people that's uh, first-time listeners out there, make sure you go and check that out and uh, build with brothers and sisters with like minds. All right, guys, so we're going to go to the people once again. You know the number is 646-716-7320. And also, I'm getting a lot of emails from people that happen to just uh, start to check out the show, <clears throat> uh, thanking me for the variety of special guests. And, you know, as I always say, the special guests are a major part of the way the direction of the show. So, of course, I always thank my special guests, each and every one of them that have been on the show, the Bay Talk for you, and thank the listeners out there for uh, calling in, sending me emails and interacting. Uh, live on the show Alright guys Well I don't really see any other questions I see people listening though So I guess uh, Brother Antoine LaVar uh, You guys want to add anything Or say any final words uh, Start with Antoine Anything you want to say uh, No uh, This uh, Nothing more to add to the class I just wanted to say that uh, This is just another beautiful lesson Brought forth And I hope that uh, People really um, You know Go back and And, and research some of the things that uh, that was brought forth tonight, and uh, you know, just continue to uh, to study hard and, and and to continue to be hungry for this word, and that's uh, that's just about it. Shabbat shalom, everybody. All right, brother Lavar, anything you want to add before we leave? Um, just that when the brother called in from Chicago earlier, it just warmed my heart to hear. A, a, a man who definitely has to be a man of God to humble himself. I, I love that because in the world of darkness, we, we love to see these little spots of light here and there. And I appreciate the brother. Uh, I encourage him and bless his family and bless all the brothers and sisters that, that tune in tonight. That's about it. All right, definitely. And once again, I appreciate everybody that's calling all across the globe, people in Chicago, 
uh, London, England, Canada, all across the globe, checking out Debate Talk for you. You know, the show is bringing people together. So I definitely appreciate you guys for uh, tuning in each and every week, Debate Talk for you. Uh, Brother Josh, any final words you want to share with the people? Uh, yeah, just, um, that, you know, I appreciate everybody coming out to, um, you know, hear this word. I appreciate, uh, you know, I tell you brothers all the time, um, Antoine and Laval, you know, reading for me and, um, helping me to get this word out. I appreciate Minister DeAndre. He's always supportive and, um, <clears throat> and also is a fellow laborer in the works of, um, the Messiah. And I just ask that everybody, you know, Try to be open-minded like the Bereans that it mentions in the book of Acts. He said they received the word of God with readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see if the things Paul was saying were true. And that's what I want people to do for me. I don't want anybody to just be like, well, I don't believe or I do believe and I haven't done any research. If you do the research, you'll see for yourself that this stuff is true and that you really need. This is part of our introductory to the Apocrypha. And um, I hope that this was, I I believe that this was a really easy to follow class. I don't think there was anything in there that just went over people's heads. I repeated myself a lot. And, um, of course, if you have any questions, you can, like, press one now or, like Sal said, forever hold your peace. But other than that, Shabbat Shalom to everybody. I guess you have to say a a, um, early Shabbat Shalom. After all, LaVar, remember you thought we weren't going to be here Friday, but it turns out that we showed up on the Sabbath anyway. So, you know, praise God for that. You know, and thank you, Sal, for um, allowing us a format of this magnitude to present the word to people. Got to always remember that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I see we have a you know person pressing the number one. I'm going to get to you right now uh, in a few minutes. Once again, uh, we still have a few minutes, a few more minutes on the air live on the internet. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to call in. You know the number is six four six seven one six seven two two zero. You know the slogan. This is the platform for interesting conversation and stimulated debate. This is the show where you, the listening audience, become the judge and the jury. So feel free to call in. You know the number is six four six seven one six seven three two zero. Or to send me an email at debatetalkforyou at gmail.com. Let's go to the people. Let's see what they have to say. 773-375. You're live on Debate Talk For You. Yeah, shalom, everybody. Uh, uh, can you hear me, Saul? I can hear you loud and clear. I can hear you. Okay. just want to say shalom to you, Saul, uh, to Brother Josh, Brother Antoine, Brother LeVar. Excellent. Uh, you guys set the table tonight and fed everybody something that most people don't get, and that was the truth. And I can only sit back and just uh, marvel and applaud at your efforts and uh, watch the Spirit of God work through you, brother. So excellent, as always. That's all I want to say. This is Brother DV from Chicago, and I want to say that, hey, keep feeding the people because they need this good food. And uh, you guys did a great job tonight. Shalom to everybody. Peace, brother. Praise God, Brother DV, and you know it's always Praise good to hear from you. Yeah, definitely. All right, guys, I guess we're going to pretty much sign off. If there's no more questions, we're going to pretty much sign off. Uh, actually, uh, I want to touch on one more thing before we leave. Uh, you know, I actually get a lot of emails from people all across the globe, uh, so, you know, that people would, uh, that's that been tuning into the Bay Talk for you for some time. And, uh, you know, a lot of people request debates. They request to be on the show. Uh, Brother Josh has actually been on the show from season one. Of the Bay Talk for you. For those people that who don't know, you can just go to the archives. It's like I said, the show is archived. Go to the website, and you can actually check out the first debate, the Trinity Breakdown, Part One and Part Two. Uh, that's when uh, actually your brother Josh uh, first uh, debated on the show. I actually just discovered Brother Josh by going to YouTube, and you know, at the, in the beginning, I was trying to find special guests to be on the show. You know, I was like, you know, trying to find people to be on the show, and uh, you know, the most high guests uh, opened my eyes to Brother Josh to be here. Uh, Brother Josh, um, you could uh, take this time out to actually let the people know, like, you know, because you get a lot of challenges, as you already know. A lot of people send me emails wanting to challenge you, and uh, let them mm-hmm. know, I guess, your policy uh, when it comes to uh, debates. And uh, future debates is coming up. Amen. Just to put it out there live right. on air. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm, I'm I'm glad. I didn't even know you was gonna do this, but I'm actually glad that you did. Well, see, I I'm it's not that I'm not willing to debate anybody, but when you've been on debate talk for you as many times as I have, then you start to notice a pattern in the people who challenge you, and a lot of people who like to challenge me 
come from major organizations. And I would really much rather – see, I'm the only teacher on Debate Talk for You that debates students as much as I do. There are a few others who are teachers that do it, but they don't do it nearly as much as I do. You know, most of these people who are elders don't want to waste their time debating me, so they send their um, people out. And I would just like to rather just talk to these elders because these elders, they like to hide behind their um, members and let their members come and face me, and then I beat the member. And it's like, you know, uh, okay, well, we still standing strong because he, he didn't do that to the he didn't do that to the elder. He just did that to them. So you know, I want to debate people who have a a large following and who is the leader or the elder of the congregation. I don't want to just debate some Joe Blow nobody who just hey, I'm just keeping to myself and I just do this and I don't really go nowhere. I just want to debate you and it ain't just I think I think I'm better than anybody or anything like that. But then the person flips the script who don't have a following, and they want to debate about something that's not really debatable. And then people will complain and say, oh, that was an easy debate. It, I don't pick my debate. People hear me say, say stuff on this show, and they want to take a shot at a particular thing that I said and make a debate out of that. And I try to tell people in advance, look, this isn't really debatable. This is just what it says, you know. And I don't believe in debating people about stuff that the Bible clearly says. Like, it was foolish for me to debate um, three or four times with a brother about, does the Bible say God loves the stranger? When that's written in the Bible four, five, six times. You know, that's crazy to debate something like that. It's crazy. I got another brother, you know, who wants to debate me about whether the Septuagint was used by the disciples and the New Testament writers in Jesus Christ. I don't want to debate that because that's too easy to prove. That's not even debatable. That's somebody who just wants to debate for the sake of debating or they have a personal problem with the Septuagint or the Apocrypha because it reveals something that they are teaching the wrong. So I don't want to debate exactly. people for the sake of debating. I mean, I could get on here. I can accept the challenge. You know, people, they try to play on the pride they think you might have. I just got to throw this out. I'm glad, Sal, put this out there, because I'm going to put everything out in the open. People like to, they're carnal. You know, we're supposed to be men of God. We're not children on the playground. We're not bullies at high school. We're supposed to be men of God, meaning we're supposed to conduct ourselves or try to conduct ourselves in a godly way at all times because the world is watching us. So when somebody challenges you to a debate and you refuse, you don't start calling them names and taunting them and doing a radio show on them. That's not godly. That's carnal. You follow what I'm saying? If somebody don't want to debate you, then they just don't want to debate you. But when you start calling people names and taunting them, you only just show how carnal you are. And I've had people do that to me. I had a brother come to my pastor room and accuse me of being afraid of him because I didn't want to debate him about the validity of the Septuagint. And I said, that's too easy. You can just look that up, and it'll tell you. You can go to your own Bible. I just proved it tonight by showing you the Feast of Dedication. That's only shown in the Septuagint, right? That's only mentioned in the Septuagint. So you know they had to use it. If it's not in your Bible, tell me where they got it from. It's only recorded in the Septuagint in the book that we know as the Apocrypha. Every Bible dictionary we went to said the same thing. There is nothing out there you can read that's going to contradict that. Or can disprove that unless it's written just by some local nut who has a problem with the Septuagint. And people just all want to shot. People tell you, you ain't all that. You think you all that. If I think I'm all that and I'm nothing to you, why do you want to challenge me so bad? There are other people on debate talk for you. Brother Josh is not the only person on debate talk for you. You know what I'm saying? I'm not the only person you disagree with. I'm not the only person you have to challenge. But if you want a shot at me, I ask that you at least put some time in on debate talk for you. To be true, to be uh, to be fair, most people who I have debated in the past have put some time in on debate talk for you. They just didn't jump up and come at me. You know, Carl Albert put some time in on debate talk for you. Hev Kyle put some time in on debate talk for you. The um the KOJ, Raheem, I, I love all these brothers. They may not believe I love them to death. I really do. And I can honestly say that. But before these brothers challenged me, they did put some time in. At, at least I think both of them did. And even if they didn't, immediately after they debated me, 
they got on sale show and they put some time in. So I'm not really interested in somebody who's just going to come in off the street who been listening to I just want to debate him. I mean, put some time in. Do what I did. I had to work my way up. You know what I'm saying? You need to do the same thing. You know, I just don't want to just – I want to try to give people knowledge, but I also want to give the people – and this might sound a little vain to y'all, but I also want to give the people a good show because y'all don't want to admit it, but y'all don't just listen to this just for knowledge. A lot of y'all get entertained by this stuff. You know what I'm saying? And there's no reason why – our debate should be boring. You should be able to be in, it should be engaging, and it also should be a learning experience. And that's what I try to give to people. So, I mean, I'm not afraid of anybody, you know. Don't think because I reject you, I'm afraid of you. I may just not honestly think you're worth debating or the topic is worth debating. And people have, and Sal, you can testify to this. I'm not putting you on the spot, you know, and you ain't got to say exactly what people said. But Sal can testify that there are some debates where people was like, Josh had no business debating that guy. Am I right, Sal? Yeah, that's correct. You know, then they emailed Sal that, like, why did you even put this debate together? This was just pointless. You follow what I'm saying? So that's my policy on debate. It ain't got nothing to do with fear. It ain't got nothing to do with me thinking I'm better than everybody. It's just that I don't believe in debating about things that the Bible and history are just so clear about. And that's all that is in that sound. Yeah, I appreciate you putting it out there, you know, because I'm the one that get all the emails, man, <laughs> with all the challenges. And, you know, you know, feel free, of course, though, send your emails, debatetalkview at gmail.com. But it's good to put it out there so that people can know what your policy yeah. is as far as debating other people. And, of course, I'm always looking for new contenders. You know, if you want to debate, you want to be a part of the show, send me an email, debatetalkview at gmail.com. Let me know what you like to debate. Oh, Sal, let, let, let yeah, me interrupt for a minute. Uh, you just made me remember something. Uh, and another thing, too. I do not want to debate the same people. That's one of my policies. I do not want to debate the same people over and over and oh. over again. We got some people out there that I know for a fact that if I accept a debate for them tomorrow, in a week or so, they're going to want to debate again and again and again and again. It tells you, let, matter of fact, let me, um, I'm glad you brought this out. If we got time, Sal, let me just pull this um. One verse. Yeah, we, got, up, yeah, we, have like 18, we have yeah, we have eighteen minutes. We have eighteen minutes today, though. That, mm-hmm. All right, let's go to um, let's go to, um, Lavar. Take me to Romans chapter one. This is Romans chapter one because we're talking about the works of the flesh, you know. And there's nothing wrong with debating. Don't get it wrong because all of the apostles debated. Jesus debated. The Bible tells you that. But you got some people who fall in this category, and I don't want anything to do with these people. This is Romans chapter 1. And uh, give me verse 28 and 29, LeVar, please. Read that. Okay. Verse 28, it says, Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, hating now, God. Now, now, his name and the stuff about these people who are of the flesh, who these people who they know God, but they didn't acknowledge him. Look at the description he gave. It said, full of, excuse me, full of envy, murder, debate. Now, if you look that word up, debate, in the Greek, it's the word Aries, and it means a quarrel. That is, by implication, wrangling, contention, debate, strife, barrier. So it's talking about people who are full of debate. They just want to argue, not for the sake of revealing God's word, but because they are full of debate in an evil way, like somebody's full of fornication and wickedness. And a lot of folks who come on debate talk for you, their intentions are not to try to um, edify you. They just want to prove me wrong so they can be the next proverbial top dog, and that's what they're in it for. I'm not in it for that. When I first was invited on debate talk for you, I didn't even know the person I was going to go against. I just did it because they all asked me to do it. You follow what I'm saying? But a lot of these people are trying to turn debate talk for you into a, um, for lack of a better word, a penis measuring contest, if y'all know what I mean. Y'all know what they call it. You know what I'm saying? I ain't trying to be, um, you know, 
um, you know, all perverse or nothing, but y'all know what I'm getting at. The fellas know what I mean. And that's when a bunch of guys get together and try to prove who know the most, who's the best. And I'm not about that. I applaud a lot of these brothers who's doing their thing. I applaud the KOJ. I applaud Carl Albert. I applaud Hezekiah. I applaud those brothers. We don't have to hate each other just because we don't agree with each other. We ain't got to be bashing each other on Facebook and doing videos bashing each other because we disagree with each other. We got to learn to respectfully disagree with each other. A lot of us, the art of respectfully disagreeing with people is lost on most Hebrew Israelite camps because we're taught to just attack and hate anybody who don't roll with what we're rolling with. And I had to come up out of that. That's why I don't do videos against people on YouTube unless they say something about me first. I don't go around just doing videos about people. I'm not anti-anybody. I'm just pro what we're about. That's all we are. We're just pro-truth. We're not anti-nothing. We're just pro whatever it is we're about. And people right. don't like that. They try to get mad. And like the brother said, I'm glad that brother Moshe from Chicago called in. I praise God for that. Not just because he said that his eyes were open, but he is a testimony of what people do to ABT. They try to bash me and they drag my name through the mud because they don't want you to listen to me. Like he was saying, man, we, they gave me a real bad taste in my mouth because of the stuff they were saying about you. And I believed it. He said, I fell for it. But praise God, he listened. And he came up out of it. Just like the people out there, it's a bad taste in their mouth they got about me. And a lot of y'all don't like me because of what you heard about me. Not because you actually dealt with me yourself. Your elder or somebody you hold in high respect was disrespecting me. So obviously there's no way your elder can lie or he wouldn't mislead you. So if he say Josh is crap, then he must be crap. So then you jump on the bandwagon, and before you know it, we got all these folks that just hate us. You follow what I'm saying? You don't see this stuff with anybody like LeVar and Antoine. Let me ask y'all a question, because I want to bring y'all in on this too. How many people that have debated ABT but have debated other people got videos on YouTube behind them like we did that you can think of? Mm. Dude, I in other words, in other words, whenever somebody debates ABT, they got to do a show about us afterwards, or they have to do a YouTube video attacking us further. But they've debated other people on Sal's show besides us, and those other people don't get videos, do they? Never, and that's happened every, all but maybe two, or it's happened all but three times. But one of those, uh, one of those three. That was the threat of a video. Matter of fact, the dude made a claim during this opening statement that he said, I'm going to do a follow-up video. I'm not sure if he ever did it or not, but it was out of all of the days you've done, everybody has done that or a show besides three people. Exactly. The, only, the only person I could say that was fair if he did do a video about you is he did one about me. He did one about other brothers. He he wasn't biased. He did one, and that's uh, our favorite Muslim, Raheem. He was actually fair. Right. He was the only one fair that that actually. Right. Didn't, you know what I'm saying? Right. Raheem didn't just single us out. He does. Matter of fact, Raheem actually does like an update of everything Sal does: shows, debates, everything. Right. So it's not yeah. like he's trying to just bring people down. He actually trying to keep people interested in watching debate talk for you. But I, I bring this out to show people that this is the reason why. I can't debate everybody because every time or almost every time somebody debates ABT, they take it too personally. I mean, they just do. Why is it that when I debate you, you got a video? You know what I'm saying? Oh, we got to get the video attacking him. But you go on the sound show and you debate other people, where are your videos against him? You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Where are your videos bashing them? Where are your Facebook um, posts? Dragging their name through the mud. Where all that stuff? Where's all that stuff when it comes to them? People make this stuff too personal. You follow what I'm saying? They take it too personally. A lot of these folks that got personal vendettas against us have never even met us. They don't know anything about us, and they even be on Facebook talking about stuff we do, like they've actually ever fellowship with us before. They over there doing that. How would you know? You ain't never fellowship with us ever, and nobody you know has ever fellowship with us. Ever. You follow what I'm saying? So, Sal, I'm putting this out here to let people know I, I really would like to debate more people, but it's like when I debate people, it does 
something to them. It's like they change and they start stalking us and they start um, dragging our names through the mud. If anybody comes on your page and say anything positive about ABT, they the first one up there to say something. You know what I'm saying? One brother said, you know, he know he is. He probably listening. He said if I it was when Lavar and that's one did the show. He said if I hear anything else from ABT, I'm gonna puke. He he actually said that. And the crazy thing is, Sal, that brother actually agreed with a lot of stuff we teach. But you had a guy on your show who was promoting homosexuality, and I don't recall that brother saying that wanted to make him puke. That show wanted to make me puke. The idea that God ordained homosexuality, oh, that definitely gave me a sick stomach, right? But that didn't bother that brother right there. You got folks come on there saying all white people going to hell and only Israel going to be saved, and they on the corner cussing people out. That didn't bother that brother. But when we teach, that makes you want to puke. That's what I'm saying. They get too personal with it, Sal, and that's why I just try to just hang back, and I just rather teach because these brothers, they – it does something to I'm having a, a adverse effect on these people that I don't want to have. I would love for this debate, walk away, still be friends, but it don't go down like that. These brothers just, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I really don't know. But that's what I got to say on that. Yeah, no, shout out to those people yeah, that send me right. emails. I'm getting, I'm getting emails as we speak right now, and I've always getting emails each and every week from uh, hundreds of people that always say they're learning from these debates, and, you know, they always let me know, Sal, I didn't know about that, and thank you for setting up that debate, and, you know, so people are definitely learning from these debates, and I really appreciate um, each and every special guest that come on the show in the Lions, then, <laughs> and, uh, you know, hash it out out here on Debate Talk for you. And uh, uh, there's a way to actually debate. I mean, you know, if you're into politics, and you watch the political debates, you see Barack Obama, Mitt Romney, these guys, they debate, and you don't see anybody, like, going crazy and, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, exactly. at each other. There's a way to debate where it can be edifying and people can learn from these things. So, you know, shout out to those people that learn from these debates and, you know, always support the show. I see we got a call over here. Let's go to the people. Uh, 302-333. You're live on Debate Talk for you. Oh, yeah. Uh, much love, much respect. Uh, I was in earlier, but there was another call right quick, and I got in where I can fit in, and I'm glad that I was able to get in. And as I heard, uh, I was listening to some very, very beautiful things that could bring everybody together if we would just share some information that right now we haven't heard before. And none of us are right until we get some freedom of justice. However, y'all have made a great case coming from Hanukkah, which is so important. And I just want to mention one man on earth who influences millions, maybe hundreds of millions of people. And his name is Vascar, son of God. He's known as the Pope. Right? Well, now, say it again. No, nah, that was some background noise. Go ahead. That was some background noise. All okay. right. Well, when we look at this guy, Vascar, son of God, we look at the influence the where he can influence European. We look at he can influence Latin America from Mexico, Bolivia, Peru, Colombia, Haiti, Jamaica, where the majority of African and indigenous people live in the Americas. And this man, Vascar, son of God, known as the Pontiff, can influence many people even in Africa. What's so significant about the Pope today is that this Pope, the Pontiff, says that people over prophets is the repentance and the ethical moral change that the world must have. This is this guy who is a pope from the Americas that does not live or preside in the United States of America. And that's so important because the majority of discussion that I've heard up to now to one-fifth of the population now, the pontiff, the pope, is not the pope of the United States of America. He's the pope of the whole human planet, known as Vascar, son of God on earth. So mm. whoever mm. has the Bible, Torah, or Quran, there has to be someone that can speak to this guy, as well as all the other cardinals, bishops, monsignors, prophets, the uh, sheikhs, the imams, the ministers, the uh, pastors, Someone, and that someone is you're listening to, Mandela Khan, the connector. 
the Pope of Mother Africa. And nobody can escape that for this reason. Everything is in total recall. And the reason why this... Yeah, sorry about that, brother. We got like six more minutes left on the air. Uh, six more minutes left on the air. Uh, brother Josh, anybody want to apply to that before we go? Uh, I really, I, it sounds like something that he would really have to go into a lot of detail on, so I can't really um, say anything because I don't really understand exactly where he was going, so I don't really have a reply. Yeah, yeah. Well, once again, you know, I appreciate your call, brother. Uh, Antoine, you want to say something before we go? Uh, no, I have no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. Uh, once again, I appreciate everybody for tuning in to Debate Talk for you. We're here each and every week, Monday to Friday.